Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy that the organizers are giving me an opportunity to talk about my favorite topic since um, the 80s, uh, when I realized that um, the, the biggest thing that I could ever achieve would be to build something that is smarter than myself, such that I can retire. Um, we have made some progress in that field. I'm going to talk about learning systems that not only learn to improve in a particular domain, or maybe in this domain and this domain, but which also uh, have access to the innards of the learning algorithm itself and can rewrite the code. And um, there are no limits to these rewrites except uh, for the limitations of computability itself. And then the question is how can you train such self-referential systems to become better and better learners over time where the learning algorithm itself improves the way it learns and improves the way it learns, the way it learns, and all these things. My first publication on that, there's a little trick in how to um, move these things forward. What is it? Can you can somebody quickly help me? Um, I have now this line, but how do I While we are uh, searching for an answer to this, to this technical problem, um, I will uh, quickly say what learning to learn is, in my point of view, what it is not. Namely, it's not just transfer learning. We all know that if you have a deep convolutional neural network, for example, and you train it on lots of different image databases, then um, then you will much more quickly be able to learn an additional uh, data set on top of the existing ones. Because if you uh, train on 10 different um, image uh, sets, then you will get a rather general vision preprocessor and then you can do almost one-shot learning as new images are coming in and you just have to uh, modify quickly the connections of the top layer towards the uh, output units to uh, retrain the thing to learn um, additional images based on the um, the previously learned ones. But that is transfer learning. Oh, that's my name and how to pronounce my name. Uh, this is transfer learning, um, which is an old hat also. Many people over the decades have profited from uh, transfer learning. And this is not what I want to talk about. Transfer learning is a special case of learning to learn, but it's not the exciting, um, true, radical um, way of learning to learn. And then also, um, the other limited type of learning to learn, which is about adapting hyperparameters of existing learning algorithms. And that is also not the true uh, learning to learn approach in my point of view. I, I'd, li I'd like to defend that point of view in the next few uh, slides. Rechenberg and Spiegel, for example, in the 60s already had these evolutionary computation strategies and there's a mutation rate in there. And the mutation rate uh, defines how often uh, the search algorithm updates the, um, the different bits in, in this uh, distribution of uh, objects that make up the search space. And the mutation rate itself has an influence on how this learning proceeds and so they were able to adapt that as well. So a limited kind of learning to learn, but not the universal. Um, the universal kind of the radical learning to learn is about encoding the learning algorithm itself in a universal language, in a, in a universal programming language, which allows the learning algorithm itself to inspect itself and to modify it itself with um, with no limits except for the limits of computability such that you can run in principle arbitrary <coughs> learning algorithms on this universal computer on which you are doing this and this universal computer can be a traditional machine but it can also be a recurrent neural network which is a universal computer to, uh, to the extent that on a recurrent network the weight matrix is the program and you can uh, generate on a recurrent network programs or weight matrices that uh, compute anything that you can compute on this laptop. Now what you have to do then, now you have the, the setup um, of a, a self-modifying code and then you have to surround that with a recursive framework that allows this um, credit assignment process through the history of better and better learning algorithms that the system is generating as it is trying to improve its performance. Uh, you have to 
somehow credit assigned to all these recursive chains of self-improvements such that uh, in the end your thing becomes a better problem solver. And already when I was a baby in 1965, that was good, and he um, speculated uh, about self-improving machines, and the idea is, of course, you have a self-improving machine, which starts as a rather dumb thing, and then it improves itself, and it becomes smarter, and then it um, improves itself even further, and becomes even smarter, and so on, without limits. Uh, but back then, there were no concrete algorithms, and as far as I know, the first um, a uh, concrete algorithm was in my um, diploma thesis. Now this is a list of my learning to learn papers, or some of my learning uh, to learn papers since 1987. The first thing was really my diploma thesis, where the goal was um, to, to write a learning algorithm that not only uh, becomes better over here and here in this domain and in this domain, but learns the learning algorithm itself in, in hierarchical and meta fashion. <coughs> I will say a few more things about that. Then um, around 1993, I try to build return networks that run their own learning algorithms on themselves, being able to change and modify all their weights and arbitrary computer reflection, and then use a simple, slow learning algorithm such as gradient descent to learn a better one on, on, on running on the system itself. And then an important one, uh, an important paper from my perspective in 1994, something um, which I um, plagiarized also for the title Learning, How to Learn Learning Strategies, that's um, 1994, a way of um, doing this credit assignment process through better and better learning algorithms, and I'm going to explain that in a, in a minute. This is the uh, cover of my thesis in 1987, where, um, where you see a robot that is trying to bootstrap itself in seemingly impossible fashion. So, uh, what was going on in that thesis? Well, uh, back then, genetic programming was already invented by Kramer in 1985, and this is just about evolving computer programs, and you have mutations of computer programs, and then um, I noticed that many of these mutations and evolutions of computer programs are really, really slow and uh, misdirected and so on. And so the idea was then, okay, let's have a second level on top of that, which also works on general computer programs, but there the domain is improve the uh, computer programs from the lower level in a way that goes beyond simple exchanging of genetic material and stuff like that. So arbitrary computable um, combinations of the code that you can find in the lower level, and then on top of that, yet another meta level opening recursively, but all um, terminating in the performance on the current domain. So giving the, universe, giving, giving the um, system the opportunity to improve its learning algorithm and the learning uh, to learn algorithm and the meta, meta, meta learning algorithm in a recursive fashion, which however is anchored in the real world where the performance is measured um, such that uh, we have uh, have a ground truth. And then um, in, in the 90s we um, started uh, working instead on uh, these parallel sequential uh, recurrent neural networks, recurrent neural networks which um, can run arbitrary programs, and these are maybe in this um, three-dimensional universe the most plausible general purpose computers because in this universe you have three dimensions and you have light speed constraints and so on so all future hardware in, is going to look a little bit like uh, what we have in here namely many processes in a compact three-dimensional volume connected through many short wires and few long wires to minimize communication costs and uh, then the observation back then was uh, that you can take one uh, network one control network which learns to quickly change the weights of another network which is a fast weight network where from one millisecond to the next these uh, weights can dramatically change such that you can have immediate uh, short term memories and some things like that can also be wired up such that you get universal computers and you already see where this is going. So Malzburg in 1981, he was the first to have fast weights and dynamic links, as he called it, but they were not end-to-end -end differentiable, and so what I did in 1992 was to make this end-to-end -end differentiable such that the controller could learn to use these fast weights in a, in a good way. Now, um, you already see where this is going. As soon as you have a network that is changing the weights of another network, you can recursively apply it to, to itself. And, um, and then I had a bunch of 
passed away papers along these lines. Uh, one of them uh, in 1993, where um, a better way of addressing the internal uh, connections uh, was proposed. Uh, a recurrent network that uses internal attention to quickly associate um, patterns with other patterns through fast weights and the whole thing end-to-end -end differentiable. And a very similar paper is uh, presented at this NIPS conference uh, by Barr and Hinton. So I'll have a look at this one. Now, um, we can use these fast weights also to um, reinforcement learn. So what I'm saying here is not really limited to gradient-based uh, learning, but also uh, other techniques can be used to optimize the performance of such systems. And Faustino Gomez in 2005 was, was um, the first author of the paper where uh, fast weights were used to um, learn to control double pole balances and stuff like that in constrained conditions where you had long time lags between relevant events, <coughs> deep reinforcement learning back then with fast weights in 2005. Now the exciting thing was to realize that if you have a recurrent network, you can run arbitrary algorithms on it, including arbitrary learning algorithms. Arbitrary learning algorithms, That's, that was in 1993, an ICANN paper, where you, uh, give, let me give you an example, you have a, a network which has a million <coughs> units, and maybe each unit is connected to 1,000 units, which means you have a billion connections. Now, with a billion connections, you have about two to the 30 connections. So in this network, I dedicate a couple of special output units, two to the 30 um, uh, address, addresses require 30 output um, uh, units to encode arbitrary addresses of connections within the return network. And then um, there is a, a machinery set up such that the network itself can address and read arbitrary connections of itself and can modify them quickly from one millisecond to the next. And then you see that in principle any computable weight change algorithm can run on that thing and be applied to the system itself. And I set it up that, such that the whole thing was differentiable so I could use a slow uh, gradient based uh, algorithm to train this whole system to do gradient descent through the entire um, fast weight dynamics and so on. And back then, uh, I didn't use LSTM, but just uh, normal RNNs, which is not a good way. But then, in 2001, Sepp Hochreiter, who may be here in the audience, he, um, he didn't quite the self-referential thing. He had one network that learned the weights of another network, which in itself ran a learning algorithm. And after this learning procedure, the meta-learning procedure, this network was not, um, did not change its own weights anymore, but nevertheless it used its activations to um, encode all the things that you need as you are seeing new data coming in through the input units, and these, uh, these data include both the um, function um, inputs as also the target outputs that you want to learn now. And as this data is coming in, internally the network computes error signals and all kinds of things after learning, and the whole thing learns 30 times faster than gradient descent, the method through which it was trained. 2001, practical meta-learning, um, learning a learning algorithm on a recurrent network, an LSTM network in that case, which um, which, at least for a certain limited domain of quadratic functions, was represented within its recurrent connections a learning algorithm that was faster than the, um, than the original um, learning algorithm. Now, in 2004 then, um, I thought all of that is not good enough and what we really want to do is reinforcement learning in the... In the in the domain of learning algorithms. And so what I did, I set up a, a system which um, encoded the learning algorithm itself in a set of instructions, and let me show how this works. So here, here you see an instruction pointer which points to this uh, pink thing there, this pink column. The pink column is a probability distribution, a probability distribution on a bunch of instructions. And on the left-hand side, you see the instructions that are possible. There's an adding instructions, a multiply instruction, a jump less equal instruction, which basically says if a certain uh, cell content is uh, of, of the cells of there in, 
you know, in the internal storage that it's using, if that is smaller than five, then jump to address number 519, and then the instruction pointer will jump there. Then you have um, a couple of other instructions, some of them interact with the words, or you have move agent. Some of these, um, these, these instructions take parameters. Move agent, for example, takes two parameters. How far should I move, in which direction should I move, and so on. And then this goes through the internal world, and new data comes in from the external world, and there's uh, fed into the internal storage, and there the system can keep computing and so on. And in the beginning, all these probability distributions are completely random. So this thing is now running, and it's a general purpose computer, and it computes all kinds of silly things that it was computing. And some of these instructions are changing the code itself. They are changing the probability instructions themselves. So there's a particular instruction which says, increase probability takes two parameters, namely um, the address of one of these columns and then the number of the instruction whose probability it wants to increase. And this is then um, this is then executed and then you have a kind of a new, slightly different, or maybe strongly different um, system, computational system, which um, in, in that way can continue to change itself and increase or decrease probabilities of certain instructions. So for example here, 0.7 in this particular application is the most likely, prob uh, the highest probability. We choose the action move agent. Now uh, it has two parameters. Um, the instruction pointer looks at the parameters there and, do, and, and chooses some of them and um, makes the move in the external environment. We get feedback through the um, internal storage, which is manipulated through the sensors, and then we uh, do a jump to the next instruction pointer position, and sometimes we have conditional jumps and so on, and sometimes we have these changes of the policy itself, and we have now a system which in arbitrary computable ways can change its own policy as it is going. So, it's, it can run arbitrary computable <coughs> running algorithms on itself, and so now I need a requested framework which, which makes sure that this thing gets better over time, all the time, such that the early changes in the history of self-changes are kind of uh, are, are keep, are taken care of, um, and, and you credit assign early learning algorithms with respect to their performance, which is measured by the performance of later learning algorithms later in the history of this lifelong learning system. Now here's an example of um, what you can do. Um, I, I, I quickly tell you what is the, what is the main, main uh, force that uh, makes sure that this thing is getting better and better. Sometimes you have a self-referential instruction which just says, set checkpoint. That checkpoint is just an instruction which says, now I uh, look at how much reward per time did I get since the last checkpoint. And now the big question is, during that time where I have executed self-modifications and other interactions with the environment, did I get more reward per time than before in the previous interval? If so, everything is good because then I have an, a reward acceleration going. If not, then I pop up the most recent self-modification, delete the most recent checkpoint, go back to the previous checkpoint. So I have to have a stack which keeps track of all these self-changes, and I undo all the self-changes that were not followed by long-term reward acceleration.s This forces the system to come up with a with a sequence of learning algorithms that um, lead to more and more reward intake per time. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. Does that not make sense to anybody? And again, we have a third group. Who didn't understand the question? So, we force the system to credit assignment all the way back in um, in the history of learning algorithms that it keeps improving, but every time in the life of the system we are ready to undo even old self-modifications if they have not been empirically proven to lead to uh, uh, improvement in terms of reward per time. So here's an example, and that is 1997, with uh, Nick Schaudolf and uh, Jim Zhao, that was done. There you have um, two agents and they interact using a set of primitives and this is after learning. So 
And the goal is to move around in this thing, and one of, uh, there are two agents, and um, the, the solution to this problem is one of them has to go down there and grab that key, and then um, have to, has to move up there to the other door, where um, there is the other agent waiting, uh, and only this key will open that door. And then it has to move in and grab the other key, and move over there, and go to this door, which can be opened only with the door, with the key that you can find in this room. And then the first guy who ends at the goal, the black dot there, he is the, the winner and gets a reward, and the other one gets also a smaller reward. We have got five minutes left. Then, we, um, in the beginning, everything took 300,000 steps. Now, just to give you an idea of the initial buyers and the initial primitives, how long did it take just through random actions to solve that problem for the first time, 300,000 steps. But it kept improving itself, and it tried lots of things. The stack of self uh, changes grew, but popped down again and grew. And finally, about 200 self changes, the self modification sequences were very stable, and only the top 10 maybe kept changing, because um, it was very sure now of the real usefulness of these first 200 learning algorithms, if you will, uh, which set the stage for the later learning algorithms. <coughs> And then it was able to uh, get the trial time down to uh, 5,000. And this is one example where, where it, um, where it um, um, was already pretty good. This is an empirically uh, motivated, self-referential, totally self-referential system, self-modifying code, where the learning algorithm <coughs> itself gets better and better over time. And then I thought, is there a best possible way of uh, doing self-modifications? An optimal way of doing self-modifications? And that's, um, that's then what led to the Gödel machine. So Gödel, Gödel, put Gödel of course, was the founder of theoretical computer science in 1931. He, he used the integers as a, as a programming language, as a coding language, and he was then able to construct these self-referential statements, which basically say, I am not provable by a computational theorem prover. And um, either that statement is true, which means there are sentences or statements in mathematics that cannot be proven formally, or all of mathematics is flawed in an algorithmic sense. Self-referential statements that allow him to prove things like that, and in honor of this achievement, I call that the Gödel machine. The Gödel machine can change itself, its own code, in arbitrary ways. It has a proof searcher on board, which is part of the initial code of the system, which also can be rewritten. And it's trying to come up with proofs that a, that a certain program Q is going to change the Gödel machine um, within a certain time interval, such that, um, that the resulting system will um, receive more reward per time than um, the previous system. And, um, and I see I'm in the last hour of my presentation. So, there is a, a little insight which basically shows that any such proof means this self modification should be executed right now because that's the best and optimal thing you can do. It's not worth waiting for the theorem prover to come up with an even better self modifying program. Think about that. So, an optimal self change um, uh, comes out of that. And, um, and we have little time to, to uh, say much more about that. However, um, uh, all of this is, um, is um, in certain <coughs> limited ways already um, part of certain systems, and we have a little company which uh, uh, tries to make this next step towards self-learning uh, AIs a, a reality. And uh, maybe some of you have seen the self-parking Audi uh, of, uh, of the collaboration with Nascent and Audi, uh, where, um, uh, where we think uh, we have a beginning of um, transferring such concepts into the real world. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
at a given moment in time, it has a proof searcher and it says, now here's my program queue and I can show it. Because the proof searcher knows axiomatically how does the machine work. So a given machine has a certain way of storage manipulation and the primitives that can do it can predict what happens if you do that and that because it has an axiomatic description. And then it uh, comes up with a proof and it says that now I should execute the subchain and, um, and the proof says that it will lead to more reward uh, than before. So the utility function is also part of the axioms, which means that you have um, a proof that a particular self-change, which is executed right now, which would be executed right now, within a certain time limit, which is um, reflecting the time that you need to execute the change, and also it's going to take time, then um, it should be executed right now, otherwise um, you will get less reinforcement than that. And so this proof recursively basically shows that it's not worth waiting for an even longer uh, uh, proof of another program Q coming in, which um, may lead to even more reward per time. So recursively it must have taken care of that, otherwise there wouldn't be a proof. Okay, so it doesn't prove that it's necessarily the best thing you could possibly do. No. It proves it's the best thing you're going to find. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And there may be self changes, so this is a proof thing, that there may be self changes which are better for the Gödel machine, uh, but are not provably better. And it happens all the time that um, in, in complex systems you have um, certain things that are true, but you cannot prove them, as Gödel himself showed in 1931. Yeah. Can I ask you to clarify some your point of oh, over here? Where's someone's name? Oh, yeah. <laughs> to clarify the checkpointing thing. So you mentioned so that the system decides it wants to make a checkpoint. At that point, determines if there was a, a positive delta in the reward it had in that episode, and then if not, rolls back. Yeah. Now you mentioned the need for a stack, but if I just maybe I understood you incorrectly, it was seemed to me by your specification that the previous checkpoint was the best of all the previous ones. So what would inset, does it reevaluate that checkpoint? Yes, it does all the time. Roll back again. Uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, let's look at the stack um, of um, self changes, which we can still undo. Basically, so the stack is about keeping information that allows us to undo the self changes. Now, at a given moment, we have I don't know 200 elements in that stack, and each of them, each of them, that's why it's called the success story algorithm, is followed by more reward per time than the previous one. So it's a history of self acceleration. Now, suddenly, maybe because I haven't su sufficiently collected statistics, it turns out that. Um, that um, the learning algorithm that we had about uh, three checkpoints in the past is in the beginning looked really good, you know, because there was an acceleration, but in the long run it isn't really good. And it maybe changed the situation such that subsequent learning algorithms became worse on average. You know. Then, at some point, this will be discovered. Now, the system itself allows to set the checkpoints and um, um, it will always redo all the previous checkpoints until the success story criterion is satisfied again, which means you are always willing to go all the way down in principle. Um, because you say, hmm, maybe sometimes it takes a couple of days or weeks until I figure out whether something uh, that I did as a change of my policy in my former life really was useful in the, set, uh, in the sense that it set this set the stage for later changes, which um, were hopefully useful. If there's no sufficient um, empirical evidence for that, you pop it off, and it becomes a system which has basically collected more statistical evidence since the last checkpoint that something is wrong. And so that's how it um, cares, takes care uh, of by itself of this issue of getting enough statistical evidence. <coughs> yeah. Time for one very quick question. This process of finding good program, can this be um, modeled as reinforcement learning? Yes, here yeah. for example, this is a reinforcement learning system and it tries to uh, maximize reward per time. So it always tries to get more reward per time interval. That is the basic drive of the system. Yes, thank you. <coughs>
Okay, so next, uh, it's a great privilege uh, introducing Josh, who is my PhD advisor. So this is going to be a joint talk. I think the first talk is going to be Josh, and then Kevin Ellis, who is uh, Josh's PhD student. And I think they're going to talk about Bayesian programming, so they're going to be looking forward to that. Wait, maybe someone who knows how to actually do this can tell me how to get this screen there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for, for inviting me. Uh, this is going to be a joint talk with Kevin, which means I'm going to talk for about five minutes, and then he's going to talk for the rest of the time. Um, it's, it, it's a great honor to be invited to this uh, workshop. I think this is the single most important topic in NIPS, and the single most important topic in all of AI, really. Um, you know, I'm kind of an outlier here. I don't really you know, do um, neural program adoption, although Kevin and I are both interested in, in going in that direction, and so we've learned a lot here, and we'll have more to say about that next time. Um, also, you know, I come from cognitive science, and my main interest is in understanding how the human mind works in computational terms, and then engineering more human-like AI, mostly as, a, as, as an illustration and as a proof that we've actually learned how to characterize human intelligence in computational terms. So why are we interested in program learning, right? Well, I think there's, the answer is very simple, right? If we want, I think the dream of many of us, like when Tejas was working with me, we, I think there's a common dream that we shared, which is we want a universal framework for understanding the nature of human knowledge and the learning algorithms that build it. And there's really only one candidate, I think, and that's probably shared with many of the people here, this belief that the, the universal way to think about knowledge is as a program, different kinds of programs for different kinds of knowledge. And so the, if there's one master learning algorithm, it's got to be some kind of program learning algorithm, or at least framework. So that's the big picture of what we're interested in. Now, just to give a, 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 just a, give a sense of a, a, some of the kinds of intelligence problems that might motivate this, maybe language is the, is the uh, consummate problem, right? All of us learned at least one natural language uh, starting from our early years. Um, what did you learn when you learned a natural language? Well, you learned rules or programs for generating all the different aspects of language, the grammar, the meaning, the mappings from meaning to sound, and so on. Um, as kids, we learned many other kind of language games and language-like games, like you might remember, maybe you learned Pig Latin, or many other children's games um, have some kind of program-like form. Um, when you got to school, you learned how to write. You learned how to write characters in your alphabet. You might have learned other alphabets. You might have learned all sorts of kinds of drawing. And these are just, these are just some examples of cultural symbol systems that are absolutely at the heart of human intelligence. Uh, think about gestures. Think about dance moves. Think about all sorts of other conventional ways that we learn to interact with each other. Vision is also a problem that you know, motivates many people in this community and motivates us. That can include things like this. These are very simple kinds of, you could call them visual concept learning problems. Psychologists have studied these sorts of problems for decades. For example, these, these so-called SVRT problems over here on the left. What you can see, it's, it's, it might be a little bit hard to read this, but what I'm showing you are two examples each of 12 different kind of abstract geometric concepts. So the pairs are vertical alignments. And you can, you can see, in, the, in these cases, you have concepts of, say, parallelism, repetition, reflection, rotation, and so on. And in each case, if you look at it, you should have no trouble seeing what does each vertical pair have in common that is also different from all the other concepts there. These are, these are just some of the many kinds of concepts that we'd like to be able to learn using some kind of idea of program induction. Um, if these seem too much like, I don't know, toy problems to you, think about vision in the actual world around us, whether it's in artificial, you know, human-constructed worlds like the room we're in right now, or the natural environment. Scenes that we perceive are full of program structure, whether it's like the arrangement of chairs here into, into these rows, the arrangement of people on chairs, exactly one person per chair if the room is packed, or no more than one person per chair, the arrangement of the glasses back there where Nando nicely set up a sangria bar for us to make sure we have a really good debate. Um, <laughs> when you're walking around Barcelona, I urge you to look at the manhole covers. E each and every one has some very interesting program structure. The arrangement of windows on buildings, columns on buildings, or in a more natural environment, you know, the, what, what, what generates the branches on trees, the patterns of branches on trees, leaves on branches, the spots of the leopard, the stripes of the, stripes of the tiger, the legs on a centipede or a millipede. There's no way that we're able to, we're going to really be able to understand 
how we perceive the structure of visual objects and visual scenes without being able to capture that knowledge in the form of programs. So that's the big picture. And I think, you know, that's, if there's any one route to AI, to all the things we'd like AI systems to do, to be able to learn to drive, to really drive, um, to be able to read, to talk with us, and so on, it's got to be something like this. Now, um, and I think, you know, again, I think that's, that vision is shared here. Um, where we actually are right now is much simpler versions of these problems. Every single talk here, I think, has started off with some very big, ambitious vision, and then said, okay, now we're going to scope it down to what we can actually do. So what we're going to talk about here is learning much simpler kinds of things, but you know, versions of like what I've showed you, geometric concepts, linguistic rules, simple kinds of um, procedures for transforming lists and so on, but we're motivated by the kinds of problems that we see distinctively in human learning. So I just want to set out what some of the sort of well, key desiderata or ingredients of the approach that we've been developing. And these are the three here. One is that across all these kinds of program learning problems that I've been putting out there, a, a really interesting, compelling feature for me as a positive scientist, for us, is the ability to learn from very sparse data, often just one example or a few examples. That's not to say all the programs you want to learn, you can learn that way, but we're particularly focused on those because they present a, a, a striking challenge to us. When you're learning from very few examples, there's, it, in, inherent in the problem is often going to be ambiguity, right? One example may, may be enough, if it's, if it's a rich enough example, or it may not be. And then you've got to know when you know and when you don't know. So you've got to manage your uncertainty. And then, I think also, really motivated by thinking about human cognition and how we understand the world, we have to be interested in a range of different kinds of programs, not just programs for doing things, procedures, but programs for, that will help us understand the world. It's causal processes. The, uh, so that means like generative models. So we're, we've been interested in developing an approach that has these three key properties, right? It can, it can learn from one or a few examples, it can handle its uncertainty, and it can learn both procedures, but also things like generative models that support causal explanations. So this really motivates where, uh, the, the set of ideas that we're uh, bringing in, which is a, a, a very general kind of Bayesian framework, a sort of a hierarchical structured Bayesian framework, but then mixed in with techniques, ideas, algorithms from the programming languages community. Um, and this is, this is, you know, it's illustrative of a, of a more general approach that a number of people have been uh, pursuing, which you could call Bayesian program learning. We were very inspired by Percy's work, which you saw some if you were here in the morning session. Uh, Brendan Lake, who uh, did a PhD with me a, a couple of years ago, he did the handwritten character stuff, which you saw there, another version of this idea. There's many ideas out there in this community. Um, what Kevin is going to be telling you about, right, is stuff that I, I have to say I barely understand, because to really do it right requires bringing together the kinds of things I do understand about Bayesian learning and human cognition with a whole other area of techniques coming from the you know, PL community. Um, and really his work is joint with me, but at least as much with Armando Solar Lazama. And I think it's, it's illustrative of a direction which I urge many of you to look at um, in, ter in terms of trying to bring together what really have until now been quite separate techniques. So let me, let me introduce Kevin here to uh, tell you about a couple of his projects in his version of Bayesian programming.
So rather than explain to you um, what we mean by teaching through these programs, or like what students learn as programs, I'm going to have you learn what we mean by that. Um, so I'm going to teach you from one example of a program. Um, on the left is an input of some unknown program that I have in my head. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, so I'm thinking of some unknown program, and I'm going to tell you that on some on the input humans can learn programs, it produces the output which is can. Um, and now I'm going to give you a new input, which I'm not going to give you the output. Um, raise your hand if you think you know what the output is for this unknown function. Okay, um, can someone shout it out? Okay, yeah, great. You learned that concept from one example. Awesome. Okay, um, that's the right prediction. All right, now I'm going to teach you some simple algorithms by example. Um, here's a sequence on the left of the arrow, which is the input to some function, and there's a sequence on the right of the arrow, which is the output of that function. Um, from this one example, um, you probably think that it's reversing, or some procedure like that. Um, do people think that that was like what the, what the function was? Okay, I see heads being nodded. All right. Uh, now I'm going to give you two examples of some function you've probably also seen before. Um, this one might be a little bit trickier. Um, but if you stare at it for a second or two, you probably notice that it's removing duplicates from the list. Okay, so you learn these simple algorithms from just one or two examples, but you might be thinking to yourself, well, I learned them only because I've already seen them before. But that's actually not true. There's this unbounded set of new algorithms you can learn. It's an unbounded set of like new sentences you can produce in a language. Um, so you've probably never seen this function before. Um, but if I give you two examples, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. I'm just sliding the number 443 in front of this list. Okay, here's another function you might have not seen before. Um, stare at this for a second. So what I'm doing here is I'm um, slipping these zeros into the list elements. And you can learn this routine also. Um, so these are program synthesis style problems. And if you look at the program synthesis literature, um, there's a lot of work on learning things like this. So they're also interested in learning, but the functions that they learn look a little bit different from the kinds of functions that people in machine learning are often interested in learning. Alright, so you can't learn everything from one example. This is like kind of obvious. Um, so now I'm going to try and teach you a function by giving you examples one by one. Alright, so here's the first example. Um, Raise your hand to indicate how certain you are that you know what the function is. So this is, yes, I totally know, and this is, I really don't know. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you another one where your beliefs falsify. If you change your opinion. Okay. Now do the hand thing again. How certain are you? Okay, a little, a little, people aren't so sure. How about this one? Okay, I see some hands pretty high up. Um, I think people are generally a little more sure that at this point the operation is sorted. Okay, so what, what, these, what these two instances are trying to show you is that you can learn a lot of things from one example, and also along the learning trajectory, you, you know like what you know and what you don't know. You can gauge your own internal uncertainty. Okay, so here's a different kind of function. Um, I'm going to try and teach you a new function, and I'm going to say that on the input p smith, it produces the output p. Um, so there's a few different hypotheses you might entertain about what this function is. Maybe you think that we're trying to pull up the first character. Maybe you think it's the first letter. Um, and maybe you can at least entertain the hypothesis that the function just always produces p, although that seems a little bit weird. Um, so we, we have in our mind lots of different explanations for these small pieces of data and we can judge them um, according to a possibility. We know that, for example, um, a constant program is just crazy. Most functions don't look like that. Okay, so now that I've talked about the kinds of things that you can do as humans, I'm going to talk about how you might try and shove those same abilities into a machine. Okay, so a basic observation that a lot of people have had is that if you're gonna learn something from a small number of examples, there had to have been something already inside of your head in order to bridge the gap between what you saw and what you ended up learning. So in machine learning, we call this like a prior or an inductive bias or a regularizer or something like that. And the programming languages community, they have similar ideas. They just call it a domain-specific language. 
So domain specific language is just a set of possible programs which restricts the different hypotheses you might consider and helps funnel you towards the right programs. So if the simplest way of mashing these two ideas together is just to say that conditioned on some examples of what the program ought to do, um, we can write down some likelihood model and we combine it with our prior and we get a posterior of programs. And we're going to restrict these programs to all be members of some domain specific language. So the domain specific language really has to do a lot of heavy lifting for you. And in the kinds of experiments that I'll be talking about, here's what these domain specific languages look like. So they look like recursive grammars. Um, if you want to learn a program that transforms strings, um, maybe you have a domain specific language that says that programs are sequences of concatenated um, program elements. And these program elements, maybe they're constants or regular expressions or things like that. But they don't include like arithmetic operations or they don't include like recursion or things like that. In contrast, if you're trying to learn to do something like sorting, maybe you want to start out with a representation that looks more like Lisp. So here's a grammar over a subset of Lisp. So really this is saying that when you're confronted with a new problem, you have in your head a lot of knowledge about how to build solutions, and that this explains like, how you're able to do it from so few examples. Okay, so um, we have this algorithm called program sampling, which solves exactly that problem. So given a set of examples and a program space as a domain specific language and a prior, over elements of that program space, it models the posterior, the program condition on the examples, um, by drawing a bunch of posterior samples. And at a high level, what it's doing is combining ideas from the PL community, so they have really cool tricks for searching for programs, with some machine learning techniques for sampling. Um, I don't want to dive too much into the gray details, I'll just refer you to our paper for that. Um, but one feature that I want to point out here is that it's not an MCMC algorithm and it's not genetic programming. Um, we're using a constraint solver, um, so a tool that is popular in programming languages, to come up with an algorithm which will probably draw samples um, from a distribution that closely approximates the posterior. Um, so we're doing like a kind of searching combined with sampling. Um, so here's an example of the algorithm in action doing like the experiment that I asked you all to do. So if you give it that one example of a short list being reversed, it thinks, oh, the shortest program, the most likely one, is reversing. But I'm not really sure. My posterior beliefs are really spread out and diffuse. If you give it some more examples, it says, okay, I think that what's going on is you're trying to sort, and I'm also really certain of that. You can also give it a list of length four, um, which I sort of crafted so that there's an alternative, simpler explanation. Like, if you ask me to sort the list 3, 2, 4, 1, it produces a sequence that just counts up from 1, and it learns a degenerate solution of counting up the list length. And in fact, because that program is fairly short, um, and so has a lot of prior probability, um, the distribution is really peaky. But if you give it another example, it can revise its beliefs and say, okay, like I'm pretty sure that what's going on is the routine is sorting. Um, so we don't consider like a finite set of possible programs, we consider um, this space of programs generated by this recursive grammar. So, for example, um, here's the code that's synthesized for um, reversing a list. Um, and this is the, this, so this is the most likely solution found by the system, but it also samples incorrect solutions that maybe overfit the data a little bit. So, like, here's an incorrect um, reversing procedure. Um, you can teach it to, for example, count the number of times that some list element occurred. Um, so, um, and if you ask it for more samples, um, it can say, okay, here's another alternative combination. Um, and you can also teach it to sort. And there's like um, different degenerate solutions that it might also sample. Um, so you can teach it to do these um, text transformation problems. Um, so if you wanted to learn to reformat dates, you can learn a program drawn from that um, text manipulation recursive grammar. Um, and so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about ways in which we might learn programs that don't look like policies or behaviors, but look more like explanations of data. And I'm going to motivate this um, by comparing Pig Latin to actual Latin. So if you don't know Pig Latin, here's four examples of Pig Latin. Your brain is a very good program inducer, so it can probably learn how Pig Latin works from these instances. Um, and there's just a function that takes English to Pig Latin. 
here's actual Latin. Um, and if you look at the words for brow and leaf in their simple nominative form, they're the same. So you cannot think of this as a function that takes you from inputs to outputs. Instead, what you have to do is you have to appeal to some hidden representation, um, which linguists call a stem. You have to say that there's some unobserved object, which if you pass it through different programs, flex a word in different ways. Um, so you can think of this kind of unsupervised learning as being like a, a VAE or something where there's some latent code and then some function that transforms that latent code into observations. This is how we're going to frame unsupervised learning as a kind of program synthesis. Okay, so there's a whole, you, if you look through a linguistics textbook, you can get a whole bunch of these toy language learning problems. Like they're, or they're not, well they're, they're toy in the sense that they're very small. And if you're a linguist, or maybe if you're an infant, you can figure out what's going on here. So here's a sort of tricky example. Um, I'm gonna skip to some maybe more simple examples. Um, so along with Tim O'Donnell, um, we're <coughs> lifting problems from a standard linguistics textbook and encoding them as unsupervised program induction problems. Um, so for example, um, if you give it the, these dozen words, it figures out how to segment those words and explains the different pronunciations in terms of these rewrite rules. And then there's other things they can learn, like how to move around tones inside of wor words that have tone systems, or how to change vowels in languages that have vowel harmony. Sunda and Sainda, like Turkish or Polish. Um, so we briefly mentioned at the beginning that um, you can learn programs that um, like explain what you're seeing. So here's um, the image from Omniglot that we had at the beginning. Um, and these are you can think of these as being other kinds of unsupervised program induction. And you can and Brendan Lake has this really beautiful model where he says like, well, we're going to explain the pixels we're seeing in terms of some latent program. Um, so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to apply those ideas um, to these geometric concepts. So these look less like motor programs and more like um, abstract geometry. Um, so these come from the SBR team and people are really good at these. And in fact, the kind of geometric intuitions that let us be good at these are not because we went to school. If you go to the Amazon and give similar stimuli to people who've never been to, who've never been to school, they actually have very similar intuitions. So like, this basic sense of geometry is just innate to being human. Okay, so we can extend our toolkit to these unsupervised learning problems, and for each um, set of images, we synthesize a simple turtle graphics program that can render these images. Um, so for example, for some images of squares, we produce a turtle graphics program that renders squares. Um, or if we give it three shapes in a line where one is bigger, um, it can produce a program that throws down three shapes in a line where two of them are rescaled to be a bit smaller. Um, so there's a corpus of 46 of these concepts that ran into a bunch of binary classification problems, and people can learn these from around six examples. If you give our system six examples, it's a little bit worse than people, but kind of in the ballpark. And you give, if you give a whole bunch of examples to various um, standard computer vision baselines, um, they're not able to learn these concepts. So some of those baselines were introduced when this was originally published, and some of them we added. Um, and so for more details, I'd refer you to our newspaper last year on unsupervised program learning. Um, so I think that the future is getting rid of the obvious limitation of this, which is that I baked in a whole bunch of um, prior knowledge in the form of the recursive grammar. Um, you could do this through curriculum learning, like um, what Percy was talking about. Um, this fits nicely into the Bayesian picture. You can pass it as like a generative model. Um, and there's a whole bunch of um, there's a whole bunch of papers. So, so I said this was the future, but really there's a lot of work in the past that I've been pushing on this. Um, there's Percy's approach. Um, Stephen Muggleton has been working on this. Um, D. Wan Lin had a paper on this. Um, Smith Huber had a paper on this a while ago. And um, at the very beginning, uh, Solomon was saying that in order to get program induction working, you really needed some kind of curriculum learning. Um, so thank you for your attention, and we'll take questions. We have time for questions. <coughs> so you say you combine search with sampling. Can you be a bit more specific? I will read the papers, but maybe you can. 
So can you give some details about the procedure that you use? You say combine search with something. Yes. Um, so the heavy lifting of search is done by a Boolean satisfiability solver. Um, so we compile the problem into a big SAT formula and then pass that to a SAT solver. Um, but if you just give these formulas to the solvers, they um, are they're biased for solutions that are easy to find. They're, they're not going to sample from whatever prior you want. Um, and so you have to use some sampling algorithms um, called like uh, X, XOR sample is the original one. Um, and the idea is you randomly constrain the SAT formula in ways that bias you uniformly, or which do not bias you towards any particular solution, um, but which rule out lots of solutions. So it's sort of like if I wanted to sample a person from this room um, and you were all standing up, I might ask you to take a coin out of your pocket and flip that coin, and if it comes up heads, I would ask you to sit down. And I could keep on repeating that process until there are only a few people standing up, and then I could just pick one of those people uniformly at random. Um, so in this analogy, the people are programs that are consistent with the data, and I'm, I want to sample one of them, and so I have this process um, called XOR sample, which causes half of the people, half of the programs, to sit down and be ruled out. Hi. So you showed some really nice examples where we, kind of just looking at two or three examples, can infer that we're sorting a list or you know, reversing a list. And I think the reason we can do this is because we know that the program always does exactly the same thing. Have you given thought to you know, what happens once certain patterns only hold with high probability? Such a pattern is also a program, right? Um, do you think you can then still learn? Right, so this, this is kind of like the, the unsupervised case, right? Um, like in the, in the framing of unsupervised program induction, we said that there were some random choices at the top that get passed through a deterministic program. Um, so if you wanted to apply these techniques to the setting you're describing, where you're trying to learn like a stochastic program or something like that, you have to say that the random choices were set up ahead of time. And so you'd be doing joint inference over the random choices and um, the program structure. Let's thank him. So we have uh, Alex Graves from uh, DeepMind, and Alex has done a lot of influential and important work in uh, sequence learning. And uh, you might have seen his uh, latest work on the uh, differentiable neural computers, uh, for the nature article. Uh, so let's uh, hear from Alex. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about um, an algorithm called Adaptive Computation Plan for the Kernel Networks, um, which I published earlier this year. And um, you know the, the relationship of, of this algorithm to this workshop specifically is obviously around this issue of a halting problem and deciding how long uh, you need to, to spend thinking you have something or computing something before you come up with an answer. Um, and as I said, so the, the original paper is called Data Computation Time with Current Neural Networks, it's on archive. Um, I'm also going to present some very nice recent results from a paper by Michael Figurinov and others. <coughs> called um, Spatially Adaptive Computation Time for Residual Networks, and then some other results which uh, we uh, have been meaning to publish for some time and we'll hopefully get out, get out soon. And what we're, we're kind of looking at in this last study is um, what happens when we apply these kinds of techniques to more of the real world data, like move away from, from the toy problem to that way. Okay, so um, the, the motivation for this, um, you know, this work originally came from this was you know focusing more on, on the area of, of super more conventional supervised learning problems where you have a supervised sequence learning problem 
<coughs> where you have a sequence of inputs and a sequence of outputs. And, and the, kind of the, the, the problem there is that you, you as Ed discussed this in his talk earlier, you've kind of uh, you've got this lock step where the amount of time you spend processing the input is defined by just the length of the input itself. Um, uh, which isn't necessarily what you want because the amount of time it takes to, to understand or, or compute something may not be very uh, closely related to how long it takes to express that thing. Um, and so, you know, there are certain things you can do already with a, with a conventional neural network for sequence processing. You can do something like add padding uh, between the elements of the input. You can make the network deeper. So really, you know, uh, Increasing the depth of the network is increasing the number of layers or increasing the number of time steps it processes for are, are in, in my view, more or less the same thing. You're increasing the number of computational steps. Uh, but you really, what I, what I was really hoping for was to have a system where the network learns how long to think before it outputs an answer. And I think the, the, main, the main way this is most obviously useful is when you start looking at kind of algorithmic or planning type problems. So if you're looking at program induction, if you're looking at pathfinding, you know, that, you know, finding, a, finding a, solving a traveling salesman problem or something like that may take massively more time for some sets of, of you know, uh, for some arrangements of data than for others. And you're not necessarily going to know in advance how long that is. So it's nice to have something that's dynamically learning how long it should spend before it uh, gives you an answer. And, and what we've also, what we found recently is uh, even for more conventional tasks such as machine translation and uh, even image processing, where you wouldn't necessarily think that there was uh, so much benefit in this approach, it actually can be very useful, and it can make it can in lead to increased uh, computational efficiency. Because now that you have a dynamically adaptive amount of, of processing, uh, you no longer have to kind of do the maximal amount of processing all the time. But I should point out that in some sense, this is more relevant to supervised sequence learning than it is to reinforcement learning. Because if you you know if you put a, a reinforcement learning signal, you could always do something like. Uh, build in the, the amount of time it takes to solve the problem as part of the reward anyway. So in some sense it's not so difficult to, to allow a system to automatically adapt the amount of computation it does if you're already in RL land. Okay, and so you know, really it's, it's, it's quite a simple picture that I'm aiming for. We think this is, a, this is an RNN with a fixed amount of computation between each tick, so each input and required output pair. Uh, you've added these two red steps of padding. Typically, actually, you don't add any red steps of padding, and it just takes in every input. And we want to change that to something where the number of these red steps is variable. And so you see these little numbers above the red steps. Those are basically uh, uh, what we're going to call the, the halting probabilities. That's what the network uses to decide when to halt when it's finished processing, but it seems so far it's time to move on. Okay, and um, you know this is the only. I think this is the only slide I've got. Well, two slides with some um, you know equations on them. Um, but the basic algorithm is, is actually pretty simple. One, one thing I should point out here: that the, the the design choice here again uh, for people who are familiar with my work is, is to make everything differentiable. So we wanted. It's, it's quite straightforward to have um, a system like this if, for example, you stochastically sample whether or not to halt and try to train the whole thing with reinforcement learning. And people are actually uh, doing that approach. I think there's a paper about that just recently. My own experience is that it's quite hard to learn. That's a difficult signal because it's, it's, it tends to be very stochastic. And so I thought it would be nice if we could have something that, in a smooth way, decided uh, how much computation the network should do. And the basic kind of insight here is to is to when, when, you're, when you're going through these steps of computation and uh, deciding the degree to which you should halt at each point, you treat that as a, you, you kind of take a weighted sum over the computations done so far. So that instead of just running for a certain amount of time and then stopping, you have this uh, smooth interpolation between uh, outputting a, a decision right at the start and outputting one at the end. And to do this, you have, uh, we have these extra units, these halting units, they're just you know, a single extra sigmoid unit. We use this to define a halt probability, um, and then we have this slightly odd formulation where uh, we keep on just adding the, the next probability onto the existing probability at each time step. So here we just take 0.1, we add 0.4, we add 0.8, and then and now we've suddenly crossed this, this boundary at 1, because now we, we add up to 1.3. Um, and we essentially just sort of chop that off and, and, and create a weighted sum where we've got a weighting of 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and then 0 0.5 to finish off the, the you know to finish off the unit density. And then we use that to compute the um, this uh, this uh, interpolated inter both the internal states and the outputs of the network. So it's kind of like the the, the 
the thing that goes forward, uh, the thing that is emitted by the network and the thing that goes forward in computation is now some interpolation of the things the network did internally. And the point of doing that, of course, is to make it all differentiable, so we can just back up that uh, in the future. Now, one slight complication is that um, you, you want something, in general, you want an answer as quick as possible. You don't want the network, you don't want to allow the network to run forever to solve a problem, right? And, and of course, you don't, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily know how long it will be, and that, that is the whole thing problem. And so, what we have is just a simple heuristic where we penalize the network for taking too long, which means adding a, just this ponder cost, the loss function, uh, which you can then weight with a time penalty so that the network trades off accuracy and speed. And what's kind of interesting is that if you do turn this off, if you don't have any penalty for pondering, then the network really will just uh, it will never emit any output. It will just continue to think for as long as it, you know, as long as you let it. Um, and so uh, what happens is uh, we have this, um, the, the point when it crosses the threshold is now like that's the, 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 the number of steps you've actually taken. And this gives you an upper bound on the, the amount of total computation done by the network. And you have this, you have this discontinuity here. So you, because you have a threshold, you have discontinuity, you have something that isn't strictly differentiable, and we just ignore it, and, and it seems to work out. Um, and the, the original uh, formulation I tried was to have something a little bit more, uh, a slightly more um, normal uh, probability distribution here, no, normal is the wrong word, a slightly more um, conventional probability distribution. Uh, which just gave you like an, an expectation over the time of the whole thing and tried to minimize that expectation. That didn't work for various technical reasons. So it was really important to have something where you're penalizing an upper bound on the actual number of steps that the network takes. That was that was critical to getting this to work. Okay, and that's basically all. You know, as a method, this is a fairly simple thing. Um, I see it. I should say that I don't see this as sort of a single model or something like that. It's more like a tool that can be used in lots of places. So I think anywhere that you're thinking about. Um, uh, a system that needs to, to you know, to, to take a certain number of steps in one direction. You don't know how many steps that should be, and you want to learn it, and you want to uh, pass a gradient through it. Then some variant of this technique is probably applicable. Um, and we'll see a couple of, of you know variants that have actually been used. So in the original paper, I mostly focused on some you know toy experiments because I wanted to see you know uh, it was easy to construct with synthetic toy experiments, problems where it was clearly um, important to think for longer. And, and one, of the, you know, one very simple one was just adding together numbers, where um, as you increase the number of digits and the numbers you're adding, uh, and the number of numbers that you're adding, you would expect the amount of time that the network has to think for to, to increase. And so, you know, you, you can, um, you know, you can even, you can even say, well, you know, what's the, what's the normal sort of long addition algorithm? and how many steps does that need to, to perform each of these operations, and you can compare it with that. Um, and when, uh, when I ran those experiments, so these, with these graphs, these kind of rainbow graphs here, they show, well, if we take this adaptive computation time away completely, and the network basically, so in this case, I didn't, I didn't have some fixed number of steps, I just said, if it doesn't have adaptive computation time, then it doesn't have any extra steps, it's tied to the input sequence, so it just literally gets, in this case, six steps, three input steps and three target steps, and of course it can't solve it uh, as the, the difficulty, the number of digits gets too big, it just it can't solve that problem in one shot. The only way it could do that would be by kind of memorizing all combinations of two or three digit, uh, two or three um, numbers, and there's too many of them to do that. And for the various different penalties, the, different, the, the rainbow here gives you like uh, how much I penalized uh, the network for taking uh, for taking longer, it, all of those solve the problem. Um, in this case, actually, the ones with a higher time penalty solved it quicker, which I think is because they were they were pushed into a more efficient algorithm. And when I analyzed it a little bit further and looked at, well, in particular, looked at what happens to be, what happens as you increase the difficulty, which I think in this case is just the number of numbers that are being added together, uh, and you know, versus how long does the network think for? You could see there was this very clear, uh, you know, kind of linear, yeah. more or less linear relationship between the, 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 the complexity of the task and the amount of time it's thinking for. And, and you could analyze it even, you know, go into a, a single uh, a single example and look at exactly where it was that it decided to think. And I should say at this point that actually, from my perspective, in some ways, this kind of analytical side of, of the algorithm, in that it exposes, uh, if it, what it basically says is we're going to give the network a limited amount of computational resources, and then you can ask, well, how, where does it apply those resources? What, is, what does it spend its time thinking on? And this tells you something about the data, or rather about uh, you know, 
how the network, or how difficult the, the data is for the network, which I think is one of the most interesting things about this algorithm. It gives you a very nice insight into, you know, what is easy to do and what's difficult to do. And, and here in this case, you know, you can take these um, numbers that are, are being added together, and the dotted line shows how many steps of computation you need if you were just using a standard long addition algorithm. And the black line shows how many steps of computation the network actually took. And you can see, you know, it's somewhat inefficient. It's, it hasn't sort of learned an exact, exact algorithm, but it's, it's clearly, um, uh, the, the number of steps it takes clearly reflects the number of steps it needs to take. Um, and now, so, the, you know, this was a, uh, an experiment from the original paper. Now I'm going to move on to some work that Oriol Vinales has done. Uh, uh, where he was looking at his pointer networks and you know, they seemed like a, a place where... So he was applying those to uh, traveling salesman problems, uh, to determining complex hulls, and other sorts of problems with a, with a kind of um, an algorithmic flavor. And it seemed like a very natural place where, um, you know, you might want to have this, this adaptive computation time ability. Because the amount of time it takes, for example, to determine, a, you know, to, to find a solution to a traveling salesman problem is, is highly variable. <laughs> and um, indeed, he found that for, you know, uh, at least for, for convex hulls, you, you got a you know, great increase in, in accuracy by adding in this ability, this, this adaptive computation time. And he also got um, nice uh, improvements for the traveling salesman problem. Um, he did point out to me, so if we, if we look, the, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the, the, the metric is here, but I think the lower is definitely better. Um, Optimal is 5.7, the pointer nets with ACK go down to 5.9, but there is apparently a new paper that's just come out that is do, using pointer nets, not using adaptive computation time, and using reinforcement learning to solve the problem that also does very well. So perhaps it's not essential for this problem, but at least, uh, you know, the, the pointer nets certainly did uh, significantly better with adaptive computation time than without. Now, um, one of the one one kind of real world problem that I, I applied this to uh, in the paper was um, just character level language modeling. I looked at Wikipedia, and there I really didn't get a very clear result. It wasn't it wasn't obvious that you know adding basically what this meant was it's predicting text one character at a time, and it can think for as long as it likes before it makes the next prediction. And it wasn't very clear that there was a huge benefit to this. Um, and, and my sort of intuition there is that you know. Uh, for language modeling, uh, if you've broken it up into individual characters, you already have a lot of steps of computation per word, so perhaps it wasn't so essential. But again, it did give very um, interesting insight into the data, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this slide here. Um, what, I'm, what I'm plotting here is I'm showing at the bottom, with the black line, shows how long a recurrent neural network with adaptive computation time thought or pondered for each uh, input before it predicted the next target versus the loss, uh, the prediction loss of that network and the, uh, the entropy of the predictive distribution. And the reason I'm looking at loss and entropy is these are sort of measures that people often fall back on as ways of finding, you know, uh, division points in data, finding chunks or, or, or you know, salient uh, points in the, in the data. If the loss spikes up and something must have changed or some, you know, predictive regime is different. And all of them tend to spike up for example, at gaps between words. So, you know, this, this makes sense. So, you know, after, at the end of a word, when a new word starts, that's when you're kind of maximally unsure about what goes next. After you've seen a few characters in that word, then it, it all becomes much more predictable. But even there, you can see that the, the ponder time is much more kind of systematic about it than, than the other ones, right? It really spikes up uh, at the point when it's trying to make a decision about a word, and then it drops right back down. But what's even more interesting is if you look at these ID numbers uh, in the, the kind of, these are, you know, in the Wikipedia XML tags, you can see that um, the, whereas the loss and certainly the entropy go way up, because these are essentially, as far as the network's concerned, these are essentially random numbers. There's really no way it can, it can predict these things. Uh, maybe it can predict, for example, that they often start with a 1 or something like that. Maybe there's some structure, structure confirmed, but generally they're random. And the point is that a random number will always give you, you know, there's a baseline of loss that you're always going to have. You'll always have a certain amount of entropy. You should have an entropy in your distribution. But what you shouldn't do is spend a lot of time computing it, right? Because it's not really interesting data. It's difficult, but it's not interesting. And I think that's what's really important here is that uh, looking at computation time allows you to distinguish between, uh, you know, data that's interesting and data that just you just can't do anything with. Okay. 
So then moving on with one more. So I've got basically, I'm, I'm mostly just going to be presenting lots of uh, results for the rest of this talk, because that's where we'll kind of, kind of gather together an overall empirical picture of how useful this adaptive computation time is, uh, this kind of techniques really are in like, real world problems. So I have, having looked at language modeling, um, Oriol and Rafael Yosefowitz uh, looked at um, doing language mod large scale word level language modeling. Uh, you know, with a you know a big, I think it was a big Google database, and found well, you know, to basically the first finding was that adding a fixed amount of computation, so adding basically giving five extra steps of computation between each pair of words, gave a pretty significant difference. You went from 40, perplexity of 44 down to 39, allowing that difference to be adaptive with a pondering, uh, a, you know, maximum of, of 10 using an adaptive computation time didn't actually reduce the complex perplexity any further, it slightly decreased the overall computation time. So we went from 5 down to 4.3. So there's some slight increase in efficiency, but probably not enough to be worth, you know, uh, rebuilding the pipeline for. Again, you know, we can look at how long it paused between each of these words, and, you know, it gives a somewhat interesting pattern. There's a fair amount of variety here. Uh, you know, it doesn't think very long at the, the start token, obviously, or the, or the end token. Uh, some words seem to, seem to make it think for longer. So anyway, after that, we thought, well, you know, if, if um, uh, well, this is slightly out of chronological sequence, but, you know, if langu language modeling is not so interesting, maybe translation is more interesting. Because in translation, there's a more complicated relationship between the inputs and the targets than there is in language modeling. It's just not just the case of looking back at different contexts. It's a case of taking some piece of text and reordering it and, and you know, doing all sorts of, you know, complicated, um, uh, applying all sorts of complicated rules to it. And there, there was definitely, so that I looked at the, um, the BTEC, English to Chinese uh, database, again at character level, which made it simpler to do. Um, and uh, there, there, there was definitely a trend where as the time penalty was decreased, the so lower time penalty means basically thinking for longer, uh, the perplexities went down and, and performance improved. So that gave us some hope that this, there, there was really an advantage to thinking for longer. And then again, Rafael looked at the, the situation with a you know, large-scale machine translation uh, database. Um, and in this case, it's English to French. And he looked at, you know, uh, with word-level language modeling, um, I think it was word -level, um, you know, how much can we gain from having adaptive computation time? And we, we tried a couple of variants. One where there was only, so this is sort of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. One variant. The, the computation time was only uh, adaptive between the two sequences. So see the whole input sequence, think for as long as you want, and then output the whole output sequence. The other one, uh, between each, after each word in the output sequence, it got to think as long as it wants. So that's the, the second result here. And interestingly, the first one gave a very marginal improvement, like from 37.5 blue score to 37.6. Uh, the other one gave a much bigger improvement, uh, up to 38.3. So I think, you know, the story there is that while you're translating, uh, you're, you're, you're liable to revise your judgments as you go. You know, like you, you predict a couple of words and you see maybe you made some mistake, and then it's good to be able to think for a little bit longer and look back at the input source and, and, and start again. Now, um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay, that's good. So uh, another like very interesting work that uh, I was quite unexpected to me, so it caught me by surprise, was that Michael Figurenov applied this to uh, residual networks, the ResNets being applied to image processing. And what he was looking at is, you know, in a ResNet you have this very deep network. So now there's no, there's not a, this isn't a, you know, an art, this isn't a sequence processing problem in the conventional sense. Uh, there, there's no time dimension, there's just a lot of depth. These, these, these ResNets tend to be very deep and uh, each, you know, each extra layer gives you an extra step of processing of the data. And what he was wondering is, well, you know, do we need all of those layers? Uh, there's already already been some results where people have stochastically moved, uh, you know, layers in a ResNet and found that that worked. And what he wanted to look at was, well, what if we learn how many uh, of these layers we have to, to go through uh, at each at each in each of these blocks in the ResNet? And so he had this, uh, you know, there was a straightforward application of adaptive computation time initially, which basically just said, okay, so for each block, while we're going through the block, we're outputting a halting probability. And when we're finished, that's it. We just go forwards. We pool everything together using the same you know, weighted sum over activations as for adaptive computation time, and then go on to the next block. Um, and uh, he then he then took that and went one step further and said, well, wouldn't it be nice if 
it wasn't just a question of deciding uh, how many layers in each block to look through, but how to, to have this um, adapted to different areas of the image. So the spatially adaptive computation time, you have a separate halting de um, decision for each region uh, of the image. And um, so uh, the, the you know, he applied this to CIFAR and he applied this to ImageNet and you know, qualitatively when he took this the more straightforward adaptive computation time algorithm uh, again it gave very uh, interesting analytical results and you know if you, if you look at the images here he found that the ones on the top it didn't have to think for very long the ones on the bottom it had to think for longer and there's a you know, pretty clear um, explanation for why the ones on the top are essentially simple images they're simple images with a kind of a clean background and a single object in the foreground the ones on the bottom are complex images with lots of clutter, right? There's lots of, there's more complicated natural uh, world kind of backgrounds there. And so it makes sense that more <coughs> computation is needed to, to disambiguate things. And it gets even more interesting when you look at, you know, what the um, spatially adaptive computation time did, because there, this heat map basically shows, uh, uh, so for example, for this image of a flying bird, the heat map shows which areas, how long did it, think for, how many layers of computation did it use for each part of this image? And you can see it very clearly focuses in on the bird. So it actually gives you a kind of implicit uh, attention mechanism that says like, you know, it, and, it, and it's attention at the level of um, the amount of computation that's going to throw at that part of the image. And it just naturally ignores, you know, flat backgrounds and focuses on <coughs> interesting objects. And it's the same here with the curve. And for more complicated images, like the, let's say, this uh, deer uh, feeding, it looks like, uh, it's not quite so straightforward. I mean, it's not so easy to just, you know, separate the background from the foreground, so it spends a little bit more time. And what he found, you know, and he actually, he implemented this uh, very carefully, such that he could actually uh, save computation time doing this. Um, and uh, you know what he found was that relative to a normal ResNet trained, at, you know, with, with some very great depth, uh, the performance of these uh, S-ACT and ACT networks basically smoothly, you know, uh, moved towards the, the performance of that ResNet as the amount of essentially as the, the um, time penalty was decreased and the amount of computation that they took increased. So it gives you a nice again, it's this trade-off between a smooth trade-off between uh, computational cost and performance. And for ImageNet, I think he got uh, uh, slightly better results where, um, you know, I think, I'm assuming that this image was created by, you know, looking at a ResNet as you progressively increase the number of layers in the ResNet in a fixed way. And he found that, you know, doing this in an adaptive way was actually uh, more efficient. And just have, you know, one last slide. Again, you got these nice qualitative results where, you know, ImageNet doesn't have, the images are just more complex in general than in CFAR, but there was still, you know, a clear separation between the things that it didn't, the images that it didn't have to think for that long about at the top, and the ones that it had to think for a long time about at the bottom. They're more cluttered, they have more texture, they have more, uh, especially things like, like leaves, like foliage, like branches, things like that uh, are, are very difficult to find uh, patterns in. And probably a person would spend longer looking at the ones at the bottom than the ones at the top if you measured, uh, you know, how long it took them to, to perform recognition. And again, the same thing with the, with the kind of attention map. And actually, I think in the paper he compares with, you know, uh, results uh, taken from uh, a, a database where people actually had eye tracking, you know, goggles, so you could see where the people were looking when they made decisions, uh, when they made the classification decisions. And there's like an intriguing similarity between, you know, the attention maps determined automatically by adaptive computation time and the ones that we get from, from real people looking at the same data. I think that's my last slide, where I have uh, so a couple more examples like that. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll finish slightly early, which might be a good thing, since this is the end of the conference. And uh, thank you.
Dear attendees, um, we need to start the panel. Rabbi Sagria, please sit down. People at the back, we need to get started. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to have our, our panelists here. Uh, we have some of the stars from uh, probabilistic uh, programming, from uh, programming languages, security, um, and neural networks. So this should be. Um, this is what we've been looking forward to, a uh, heated debate <laughs> between Bayesian programming people and neural network people. Percy Liang is running a bit late, he will join us soon. So, um, actually this is too noisy. Um, can we, do we have volunteers? Can, ¿Podemos cerrar las puertas afuera? Gracias. And I urge you to please find a seat. 
This is what happens when you serve sangria at a workshop. <laughs> Speaking of which, cheers. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Josh, you mentioned that learning <laughs> programs is one of the most important things we can do in AI. So I'd like to hear from all of you, what is the thing that is stopping us from being able to achieve that goal? Anyone? What's stopping us from learning programs? Nothing, we have been doing it all the time. <laughs> and uh, there are all these interesting programs. It's the code on GitHub. <laughs> yes, it is. Actually, um, for example, uh, for Vicar Networks, where you have a program space which is even differentiable, so on the program um, um, a substrate on the Vicar Network, you have um, a dense space of algorithms encoded as these weight matrix, matrices and we know of course that um, the recurrent network architecture is powerful enough to compute any uh, computable program so in that sense we have all kinds of successful uh, program search methods based on gradient descent for example which are doing the speech recognition on our smartphones Okay, so in the interest of some controversy, because I assume that's what you want. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I don't think this is going to be too controversial, what, I, what I'm going to say. But um, I think, you know, look, looking at what's going on here, there, I, you, you can make a, one big cut between two kinds of program induction. Um, one that, uh, like, the talk that Kevin gave with me was illustrative of, and one that maybe Jurgen's talk is, I mean, it's maybe it's maybe appropriate that we're on different ends of this uh, panel. I don't actually, there's almost a, you know, you perceive that you should move over here a little bit, but anyway, you know, basically, it, it, you can think of it as corresponding to, you know, two different kinds of programs. How close are your programs to source code that humans can read and think about versus how close are they to something more like assembly or machine code that, you know, is, is closer to, to circuit hardware abstractions or you know, lower level state machines. And I think, you know, the, where, where a lot of the excitement that probably the reason why this room is full of people at MIPS is because there's been a lot of progress taking the techniques which have worked in other deep learning settings and applying them like in differentiable neural computers or LSTMs and so on, just applying them to learning programs which are very, basically very low level kinds of code. Um, and they often take hundreds or thousands of examples. And then at the other extreme, you have the kind of thing that we're trying to do where you're trying to learn code that looks like a list program or something like language or grammar, some high, you know, higher level programming language. And, you know, I mean, as much as I think that this is cool stuff, we don't have nearly as powerful, um, or as efficient, let's say, as efficient learning algorithms, right? We might, be, we might be very data efficient, but what's really holding us back there is the, is just, you know, algorithmic time, processing time, computational efficiency. So it seems like we have kind of a spectrum of techniques. The kind of stuff that, on, on where I sit, you know, I think the programs are, more useful as in intelligent knowledge representations and have very good data complexity, but they have terrible <laughs> algorithmic complexity in terms of the, the learning. Over on, you know, more on the neural side, data efficiency is not, not as good and, the, the, you know, it's hard to look at the code and say, yes, this has, this has a, this has actually learned a, you know, a useful abstraction that can generalize to, to a, you know, I mean, not, I, don't, I don't want to make, make one. Um, it depends how controversial you want us to be. No, no, but I mean, I mean, I think, I think you made you made this point, right? That like, if, you know, I, I think if I want to learn a sorting algorithm, I want it to work for any list, not just things up to length twenty or forty, right? If I want to learn a finding shortest paths in graphs, you know, I want it to work for any graph, right? That to me, that's what's exciting about programs is how abstraction is able to capture the strong generalization, right? So, you know, I, I really liked Danny's talk because I thought it was it was making some progress at trying to bridge those worlds, but you know, towards the end, you had this, this offhand comment, well, I'm not so sure, I'm not yet convinced that stochastic gradient descent is the best algorithm for learning these kinds of things. And I think that's, that's pretty clear, that's what's holding us back, right? Is that we don't, we don't yet have a way to combine the best of these two worlds. So I think one of the really tantalizing aspects of the notion of programs is that kind of being oversaturated. Who doesn't want to do program induction? Because once you do it, you do everything. 
But I think that's really kind of not productive in a certain sense. Because um, we know, you know there's kind of impossibility things when you talk about programs. You can't, there's no free lunch. And the fact that you've defined as such a general space, whether it be kind of in RNM land or in kind of probabilistic program, I guess I'm kind of fashion both of you now. But, um, <laughs> but um, it, it seems like what kind of really would help drive structure is certain amounts of kind of structure, whether it be kind of sequential structure or some sort of compositionalized structure, and those type of structures can exist in kind of either, either paradigm. And I think we kind of need a language to describe. For example, in graphical models, we had notions of you know, tree width. Those, those are kind of not inadequate um, in many ways, but at least kind of we have a notion of, OK, now we're able to induce kind of these type of programs with lo local interactions. Now we can induce kind of uh, things with recursive structure, things where you, you have very, which are not very non-smooth. Um, and if we can come up with a language of talking about these things, I think we'll be able to make a lot more progress. So I'd say something maybe from the kind of synthesis perspective in the last few years that have been going on. Uh, I guess one of the issues is like even before you go inside the algorithms, like what kind of algorithm you're using to learn the uh, functions or the problems, whether it's uh, stochastic gradient design or this differentiable um, uh, computations or some other algorithm, it doesn't matter. So one of the critiques has been, like you asked the question, like why is it, what's stopping the learning? I think it's, um, uh, sometimes people feel that they're giving uh, too much, too much information, like they may have to provide a DSL, and if you provide a DSL and you provide a sketch, uh, and, or you provide the components, then people can say, well, we already know the solution because you are basically providing a lot of information. So there's all this trade-off. So forget just how it's done, just like what you're doing. Whether you're giving a logical formula, uh, pre-post conditions, uh, components, doesn't matter, examples. Uh, finding these applications, uh, domains where it makes sense to not provide too much, yet get interesting uh, results, this, this is very tricky. It's turned out to be quite tricky. For instance, uh, asymptotic complexity. People are like, okay, I, 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 you know, I learned a tree sorting algorithm or something else, but it's hard to provide this kind of non-functional properties. Uh, so it's not really, I think, a question of how fast the search is. It's a question of uh, finding applications where requiring too much information from the user, that they does not require too much information from the user. That's the, to me, the main challenge. That's, uh, finding this domain thing, mm -hmm. quantifying it. I just want to agree with that. I mean, it's, that, I should have said that. That's another, that's another big challenge. And Kevin said that at the end of our approach, and it's something Percy also addressed that for the, you know, if you're trying to learn something like interpretable programs from a few examples, at the moment, it's very heavily dependent on having the right prior inductive bias. But I think that's a direction where we have good ideas. Uh, and our, our, I think we're going to see a lot of progress over that in the next couple of years. Um, okay, yeah, I have a few things to add. Um, I actually joke with my uh, robotics uh, faculty friends in the department, uh, saying that uh, I like uh, program synthesis because it's actually you need to solve. You have all the challenges as in robotics, but we have uh, we have really easy simulator. Instead of in robotics, you have to build these physics simulators uh, with the program synthesis. Essentially, we have controllers. It's very easy to execute the program to know what they do. But in order to do program synthesis, you essentially actually have all the challenges that you need to do uh, in robotics. For example, you need to do search, you need to do planning, you need to be able to specify the goals, and understand the goals, and you need abstraction, you need uh, concept learning, and you need uh, uh, hierarchical structures. You need all of these things. Um, but program synthesis is uh, simplifies. Of course, we don't have to deal with the physical aspect. Um, but also, often, in order to be able to really uh, synthesize the programs that we care about in the real world, in some sense, you actually need to have some kind of real world understanding as well, because we don't just synthesize, synthesize arbitrary programs, we actually synthesize programs that actually people care about, because they need it in the real world. And hence, that's why program synthesis is really hard, because it's the holy grail, like what Josh was saying at the beginning of his talk, um, um, but that's also why it's really exciting. Um, that's why I think we don't have learning yet. 
So I would echo some of that um, in saying that the things that sort of keep me up at night if I think about what's preventing us from building systems that you know, scale up to like Percy slide where we have these huge code bases that are expressed in source code and that the people have built. Um, I think the two issues in my mind are we still don't have a very good way of representing the specification. So we have input output examples, we have natural language, but if you think about how real source code is built, I'm not convinced that either of those is really the specification that people have in their minds. Like if you think about going to implement some algorithm or you have some code that you want to write, like what is that representation of the problem in your head? And related to that is the issue of building up hierarchies um, that are directed in a way. So we have this, this vague notion of what it is that we want to do, and we may not even have the whole algorithm ready to, ready to write down, but we have this sense of what is the right direction to go, what is that low level uh, function that we should implement first, and then we sort of have this way of slowly building up these levels of abstraction and have an intuition that we're moving in the right direction and then eventually we get to the top and we can assemble this all together and we get the, the program that we want. I think both of those are extremely um, vaguely defined at this point and we don't have good ways of approaching them. Maybe I can echo that to a certain extent. Um, I don't see any conflict between this differentiable um, way of uh, searching for programs in the space of uh, differentiable <coughs> programs as opposed to discrete program search. I think there are certain uh, areas where one uh, method is totally superior to the others and vice versa. And then um, I feel totally at home at both ends of the spectrum if you look at the optimal order problem solver. That has nothing to do at first glance with neural networks. It's based on a fourth uh, language uh, interpreter that I implemented there. And it's, it's a totally um, um, symbolic uh, way of searching optimally for problems, which goes back, which extends it, what Levin did for his universal search in 1973. Uh, so uh, the, uh, and it's even asymptotically optimal, which you don't get for our systems uh, that are based on gradients and so on. However, uh, of course there are lots of problems, especially those where there are millions of speech signals coming from thousands of different speakers, where you want to have something like continuous search in program space. Now, what do you do? You combine these two things and you say, for example, a loop, a loop system or something similar has primitives which are neural network learning algorithms. And you wake them up and you measure the time that they consume to just do the optimal program search thing and, um, and it's totally compatible. So there is no real problem. It's not like defending one against the other, uh, but exploiting the advantages, of course. So I have another question. Um, when you, when, if you imagine a computer programming, a neural computer or one of your computers programming, interacting with the world, so it, it outputs symbols that get printed into a machine, and so it's basically learning to play with tools, um, so symbols as tools, and but I, but you would imagine that um, you know a kid learning to program would be trying different things, would see what happens. It's sort of coming up with tasks. So I know several of you have studied this, this question of how to not just come up with the programs, but actually sort of give yourself pro uh, give yourself the tasks so that you can learn to program, so that you can learn to manipulate symbols in the world. So I'd, I'd love to hear what, whether you think that this is a viable way, and also, more controversial, are symbols in the head, or should we be manipulating the symbols in the world, the code should be in the world as opposed to this sort of structure, symbolic thinking. <coughs> the I got the second. Yeah, I know you would get the second one. Uh, the first one is from Marcia, both Barton, and um, Jürgen have worked, Jürgen's got an approach called power play and Martin has an approach where he um, sort of plays, where he tries to come up with programs and also tries to come up with tasks. Um, I think I've read that if you had an address, Kraus. <laughs> um, so, coming up, with your, coming up with your own tasks, the agent that learns to program by interacting with the world. And the reason why I'm asking this is because we saw it very clearly that when Kevin presented some examples, everyone in the audience could sort of complete, so, so, 
the sequence. Uh, but what Percy presented some examples, no one in the audience could complete those examples. So there seem to be some examples that are easy and some that are hard. How do we teach ourselves to learn from easy examples, much hard examples, all the way to a billion lines of code? Should I, should I say something? So, should I? So this power placing um, is about, um, and I'm sure there are lots of people who don't know this, it's about not only um, taking a task description and then trying to find a solution to that problem, um, but inventing the tasks themselves. And the question is, what kind of uh, task is the next most interesting thing uh, or the next most interesting problem that I should learn to add to the repertoire of problem solving <coughs> skills that is growing over time. And then um, basically the approach is, and this is independent of whether you do it with neural networks or with symbolic uh, systems or whatever, and the basic idea is you, um, you search among uh, pairs of tasks and problem solver modifications until you find a new uh, task which the old problem solver before the modification cannot yet solve just by generalization, such that the new modification of the problem solver is really important, and it can now, after the modification, solve the new task, and the performance on all the old 150 tasks so far does not um, get affected or only improves. So that criterion um, you have to fulfill, and so now you're searching the set of all computational tasks which you define by predicates that um, measure whether a particular solution is a solution, uh, or a solution candidate is really a solution to the task. So now you have this huge space of tasks and solutions uh, to the tasks and solution candidates, but nevertheless, because you still have this degree of freedom of inventing your own next task, you are, of course, going to add the task, which is easiest to find, easiest to add to the repertoire, where you easiest, um, in, in the, with, with the least effort, get a proof that none of the previous um, uh, uh, problem solver skills is affected, and, um, and there you get a natural order in the complexity, in the task complexity. So like a baby, you always add the, the next cheapest um, skill that you can add without damaging your previous knowledge. Okay. So, <coughs> so I guess your question is, um, about generating new examples, ultimately new tasks. So, in synthesis, there is this method called um, Segis. Some, some people know it. It was um, it, it's an old method. It's called counterexample guided inductive synthesis. It originally appeared in 2006 in paper by Armando and uh, Raz Body. So uh, the basic and there is many 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 different instantiations of this scheme. Essentially, you generate new tasks or new examples, and you can generate them in many many different ways. You try, to, you try to restrict the hypothesis space by asking the oracle new questions. Um, this could be either simple tasks that the oracle can answer and cut the search space a lot, or it could be more complicated tasks that, they, or that the space can be cut even further. So this, um, in, this inter there, there is three dimensions here that are not well studied. One is the kind of questions you ask. You can classify uh, it, like I can give you a classification problem, you can answer yes, no, or maybe you can even answer one half that you don't know. You can ask uh, uh, a problem, if I give you two examples, you can give preference, there's many different kind of questions you can ask. Uh, so the interaction between the kind of questions you ask, the hypothesis space, and the number of questions that you ask of that kind, that has not been studied in that well. There is only recent work now, I think, from uh, Sanjit session uh, last year, on the number of questions you need to ask in order to reduce the hypothesis space quickly. Uh, but yes, there is, uh, I think, this counterexample guide inductive uh, learning has not been, uh, can be applied directly to a lot of the NTM work and NPI work that's been going on almost directly. Uh, it hasn't been studied uh, much. And there's theoretical questions that are being investigated right now. Number of questions, hypothesis space, the kind of questions you ask, these are the three dimensions that must be answered. So, um, I, I think I agree very much with what Jurgen said, that there's something very natural about, say, how children learn. I mean, developmental psychologists have studied this for a while, that children are very interested in 
what's sometimes called their zone of proximal development. Like, what are the tasks that now are a little bit harder than what I know that I'm ready to do? And I think there's, there's been a lot of interesting work on this. You could call it maybe like unsupervised curriculum learning, um, where people, where, you know, systems which kind of, you know, maybe give, are given a very large set of tasks and self-pace their way through it from easier to harder ones. When, or when I say a lot of interesting work, I mean, I know a few interesting papers. Um, a couple of which I had a little bit to do with, like for example, A.L. Vector had a nice paper in Ichikai in 2013, what, um, what he called the exploration compression algorithm, uh, where he you know, basically self, sort of self paced the system would just sort of try out a whole bunch of problems, and if it could solve them uh, on, a, on a sort of uh, small frontier, then it, would, then it would try that out, and it would keep bootstrapping through going to harder and harder problems. Or Dean Wanlin in her paper on bias reformulation also had something similar where you would have a system going through, say, a series of flash flow problems and going from easier to harder ones and, and bootstrapping its learning ability. I think a, 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 a maybe more interesting challenge, and maybe this is what PowerPlay does, I, I, I don't know it and I should learn about it because it's something that we're starting to work on, so we better learn about it so we can you know, cite it appropriately. It is, no, no, I'm, not to mention, learn from it. But this problem of like actually not just self-pacing your way through the through a curriculum, um, but actually inventing new problems, right? I think that's the most interesting thing. Like when kids are playing, they don't just decide, they don't just learn new skills, but they actually make up problems to think about that were not in any sense there in the environment before for them. Um, and so uh, we're, the question you asked about how isn't it, you know, here are some concepts or here are some programs that people find easy to learn, other people find hard to learn. It's something we're starting to think about is actually how to characterize that and a good system that can learn these programs should also be able to, I think, address that creative challenge. So I have a follow-up question to maybe both of you, though I think at a high level it seems very appealing if the agent can figure out in a self-motivated way of what to look at. Um, but what keeps the agent and kind of uh, looking at tasks which are kind of interesting to us? Because, um, I don't know. <laughs> because the space of tasks is actually very enormous, right? So the space of tasks that the agent cannot solve at the moment is also enormous. So, and some fraction of those are kind of, we would find interesting, and some of them are equally as hard, but we would not. I think it's uh, exactly the right question to ask, and the answer is, of course, occasionally, you guide the whole system by giving it an external task. Now you force it, now it has to solve this task, now it has invented its own uh, curiously, intrinsically motivated um, problems and has learned to solve them, always adding new skills to the repertoire. Now you come as a slave holder and say, but now you really have to solve this thing here. And then it has maybe to work much harder than uh, on the self-invented tasks because now really there's a, a, a goal to fulfill. Now, of course, that's how we teach our kids, you know, we let them play around, but then sometimes we ask them to do something, and if they don't do it, we punish them. And so, <laughs> And so um, then, of course, the problem solver um, is directed towards the sort of problem that um, are um, useful in the world it's living in, and uh, especially are useful for the parents and slaveholders. And, um, and in, in that way, um, also, the newly self-generated tasks are influenced because they are always driven by what's currently easy to add to what the guy already wants. So once he, he knows something important, the robot maybe has pain sensors and whatever, and now it has learned finally to Always when the hunger cells are active, the, the negative numbers come from the uh, pain uh, hunger sensors or so, always in time um, find the charging station without bumping against the obstacles, which also um, uh, activate the pain sensors and so on. Once it has learned to solve that task, it already has a whole repertoire of skills which it can easily, you know, now deviate from a little bit by saying, okay, now at least I know how to walk to the charging station, and now let's see what's uh, around the charging station and which other things are, might, be might be of interest there. And so it's just playing around again with things that it suddenly can um, grip because it is able to move uh, in a goal directed fashion because the teacher forced it. So suddenly, um, also the self-generated tasks are going to move into the direction of those tasks that you wanted to solve. Yeah, so regarding that last point, so you have self-directed tasks, um, <coughs> teacher tasks, self-directed tasks, and teacher tasks once in a while. What is the actual pressure to develop 
the kind of the same aesthetic as the teacher. Because eventually you don't want to keep on you know, pulling the student back and saying, you know, focus on this, that's what I care about, and the student goes off and solves an irrelevant thing. So, yeah, we have a very excellent question. Huh? And, um, and, and um, one, one, one answer is um, essentially um, this artificial curiosity thing, which um, we started working on in 1991, where you basically um, get reward by uh, conducting experiments that lead to data that tells you something about the world, a regularity in the world, which you didn't know yet. For example, you do an experiment, you um, generate falling apples, videos of falling apples, you don't know gravity yet, but then your learning algorithm uh, suddenly sees it can predict these falling apples through predictive coding because it understands gravity, so now it has learned um, a regularity about the world that it didn't know yet. You can measure the depth of the insight by looking how many computational resources did I need before I understood gravity to import the data, and after, the difference between before and after is the fun, the internal joy, the reward that you get this uh, eureka moment, which is then going straight to the controller, which is generating the action sequences that lead to the data. So, so the guy is now suddenly motivated to invent experiments that lead to new insights about the world that are not yet boring because not yet understood. Once they are understood, they become boring. And so that set of tasks um, just generate self-invented um, experiments that lead to additional insights about how the world works. That is this basic principle of artificial curiosity that we have been propagating for a long time. So I think that is very useful for all kinds of um, teacher post tasks. And because once you know gravity, you know, um, or other physical laws, you can solve new external typical tasks in that way much faster than without that knowledge. It's always seemed to me that there should be an additional component here, which is um, sort of trying to anticipate the types of tasks that a teacher will ask. And so thinking about um, sort of models of what are the tasks that you're being asked to do and then when you're when figuring in I think it's it seems like this component is important that you're talking about of sort of making yourself empowered and more powerful. Okay, you can answer now. But of course it's taken care for just like babies take care of that because they know of course to manipulate their parents very soon they figure out how to manipulate their parents and they devise little experiments just by you know streaming in a certain way and there the parents start moving and, you know, they are able to um, manipulate their social uh, um, uh, context and um, some of these manipulations are really simple. You don't have to be a super smart problem solver to figure out how, how to make these environmental objects do stuff that is good for you. So, all of that is part of the world model that the little baby or baby robot is uh, building of course, which is just um, going to predict what's going to happen next and when when you when you scream ten times and all that is uh, the, the parents are running towards you, that's very predictable and of course it's just part of what's going to happen in these models of the world that these little guys are building and it gets reward for manipulating the world in a, in a way that is predictable in a new way uh, which is interesting. New means interesting, but they know means boring, not so interesting anymore. And it can be unmodeled by um, simple two module systems. Uh, and uh, another way to look at it is, I think, um, often just like our class too, one way you think about what new people want to do is something you can um, uh, you can put that into two types of categories. So one is, for example, the mathematicians they think about when you <coughs> um, it doesn't have necessarily need to have any. Uh, you know, spe uh, specific uh, connections or impact to the real world is just for certain type of aesthetics uh, in mathematics. And the other types of tasks are the things that are directly related to the real world. Um, you know, we have various goals uh, in the real world that people want to figure out how to solve. So similarly, I think for uh, program synthesis to learn how to figure out what new tasks to synthesize programs for, I think one can think about it in this way as well. So one type is that maybe the agent learns how we somehow tell it, uh, uh, somehow learns about certain types of aesthetics, and that they will try to maybe uh, one type of agents. They will their goal is just to figure out how to 
uh, you know, generate new metaphors. And another type is that the agent actually wants to connect to the world and wants to synthesize programs for tasks that's directly related to the real world. And luckily, today with the internet, it's actually really, really easy. Uh, so I really like the idea that OpenAI is putting out, uh, even though it's just a first step, for example, in their gym, they have these browser tasks. So we actually have been thinking a lot about this domain as well. Because now you can actually build a really, uh, you, you, you can build an agent uh, that basically just by you know, moving your mouse, click uh, the mouse and reading the browser inputs, now you can interact with the whole world through the internet. And then naturally, there are lots of tasks that it needs to do. Uh, and also in some sense, it naturally helps it to understand what are the easier and simple, uh, easier to harder tasks. If it enters something into a form, it doesn't, it doesn't proceed to the next step, it learns something's wrong, it tries to figure out what's the right way to fill in a form. Uh, at one point it learns uh, it needs to have uh, friends on Facebook. <laughs> and Right, and then it learns what it needs to do to have other people to be friended. So then, um, naturally, uh, then there are lots of these um, tasks that are already out there that the agents, uh, as it starts to interact with the world, I think it learns what tasks to do and try to synthesize programs to do those things. And we certainly look forward to the day. I think this might be related to some of what you were saying and also you're going to um, when you talk about learning an aesthetic, is what you're saying that, in a sense, that can also be described as a program, and they could learn that. So is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, reward fun. Exactly. So that's what I was going to suggest, is that I think, I mean, there's, there's again, a, 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 it's a good old idea that a lot of people have been exploring. I'm looking over at their head, just like you and others have been looking at this in the RL world, right? Like, go, we call it making new, you know, sub-goals or options. There, it's, it's, that's, that's what they call something like maybe being able to come up with intermediate, you know, other kinds of reward functions that are not just the one that's given to you, but say, make up some new kinds of things, which are not just specific goals, but like new kinds of abstractions, right? Um, if we, another way to put it is, you know, it's, we talk about aesthetics, we can also talk about values. Um, in the big AI world, or the general, you know, the, the AGI world, we're, we're thinking about how could we get machines to have our values. Well, again, those, those can be written as programs, and learning values isn't gonna just mean, you know, learning some kind of uh, numerical function, but actually learning to express some abstract concepts. Um, so whether it's things like symmetry or elegance or the con concepts of morality, um, altruism, and so on, I think we, we, we are thinking about these and we're going to have to think very hard about them. But um, um, I, I like to say that now the connection has been made between the aesthetics and the uh, reward and reinforcement learning framework. Because it's um, already taken care of uh, through these uh, modules, which just try to compress all the data ever observed, and then uh, everything, every pattern, every regularity in the world means there's a compressibility. Whether it's a symmetry, a fractal pattern, music, where there are simple ratios between the notes and uh, between the frequencies and so on, everything that is regular um, and beautiful, if you will, or um, aesthetically pleasing. It corresponds to some sort of compressibility. Now, once you know it, it's not uh, interesting anymore. You don't want to listen to the same song 1,000 times in a row. However, as you are still absorbing these irregularities by data compression, uh, as your subjective compressibility of the data is, um, is growing through the learning algorithm that you use to find the data, you are saving bits. So there, before so many bits to encode the video of falling apples, afterwards so many bits. The difference between before and after, the depth of your insight, the fun that you have. And it goes straight to the reward maximizer. So that's how, you know, how this um, aesthetics and um, uh, this world of aesthetically pleasing inputs is taken care of by the uh, already have. So very related to that, a follow up. Um, why are our symbols? Um, the language and the code discrete. Because we at some point invented writing and there it was good to have these little symbols and they are all different. Uh, if you do an X, uh, you write an X, it's really different from mine. However, we all um, uh, tend to agree that all these different Xs stand for the same thing. and. Um, our communication forced us to come up with this, these rather concrete symbols, which then everybody considers as an X. 
although everything is really fuzzy, the exes of uh, different people are so different, everybody speaks differently about exes and so on. Nevertheless, in the little recurrent network that we have to, uh, where we reserve some space for X's and for mathematical formulas and so on, then we compress it all the way down uh, such that we can easily uh, describe the patterns that we are representing through them. I, I, let me disagree with that a little bit. <laughs> First of all, language starts much before writing, right? So, so you know, okay, we, I think we probably agree with that, but even more basic than that. like. There's discreteness in the world in, in, in many basic ways, but the, the, book, the one of the most pervasive and easiest to appreciate is the notion of objects, right? So, I mean, metaphysicians have long talked about this, but I think it's definitely true for, at, at the common sense brain that we interact with the world, there are objects and they are discrete. Um, infants appreciate this from the earliest ages. It's, it's like basically the first concept that infants have, the idea that there are independently movable chunks of matter. This chair is one, you know, if I pull part of it, the whole thing goes with, goes with it, right? Yes, I could break it down into things, and yes, at the atomic scale or below, it's, that's not true. But that's something that humans and any animal that interacts with the world at the brain that we do um, has to confront. So I think those are the most basic symbols in the brain and the mind. And um, you know, those of us who we had we had a whole workshop on that yesterday under intuitive physics. I think that my because because of the basic um, there are basic things about the world that we've evolved in that we interact with, so that our plant our plans and our planning kind of have to uh, deal with. Oh, oh yeah, that's well, let's <laughs> pour some non discrete stuff into that yet. Um, so I, I mean. I, I, we, we we're all just speculating here, but I think I think this is important because I don't I don't think people should say oh well you know maybe maybe I need to deal with the hard problems of symbols only if I'm dealing with language no I think if you if you want to deal with any intelligent system that's going to do what these guys are doing right now just interact with the physical world of objects um, you're going to have to deal with with discrete structure and you're going to have to or it's going to be extremely valuable let's say to have a symbolic computational architecture. Mind if I say something first? You do the right. <laughs> so, um, I, I completely agree. And uh, all of that is byproduct of uh, compression. So, why do we uh, create these internal symbols? Okay, we don't agree. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, we agree, actually. I, I, I was going to say that, that the, the, the idea that everything is compression, I remember reading your paper on that that said aesthetics and surprise and curiosity and fun. It was all about compression. I was, I read that in grad school and I was super inspired by it. I was also, and I continue to push, I want to push back on that idea that I don't know that it's going to be the most immediately valuable way to get all of human value. But when it comes to like sort of the basic discreteness of our mental representation, I completely agree that objects are the most, you know, symbols for objects are the most compressive thing and can't deny it. I just want to kind of agree with and echo some of what Josh said. I do think that, you know, discreteness is somehow not just about language, it's about kind of cognition, but I would even take it further, and I think it's actually kind of this property of the, the world. I think there's, you know, discreteness in some sense boils down to some sort of, you know, um, I don't know, some sort of independence, the idea that things which are far away really have kind of nothing to do with each other. It's kind of independent whether there's, you know, humans around or not. Um, and I also want to just kind of talk about the, the question. So this question comes up often, I think, especially in nowadays where there's kind of um, you know, this, you know, discrete structures and then neural nets, which have been kind of um, replacing a lot of that. And, you know, so I guess the, it depends on whether you think this is asking a kind of an existential or universal or quantified uh, statement over discreteness. Because, I mean, in reality, I mean, the boring answer is that there's you know, there's both, but I think, you know, in some sense, for complicated enough things, uh, you know, discreteness is, I think, uh, first order, it's, it's kind of the structure. There's always going to be, I think, discreteness in, in things, even if you take a, you know, uh, uh, you know a network, the architecture is a discrete thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't have continuous things on top of that. Of course, I mean you have the, the you know the, the the trellis, and then you have the, the things which are kind of growing organically on top of that. But without the discrete fun foundation, I, you can't kind of grow as much. So I think you know whenever people say that uh, oh you know things are soft, therefore we should throw out all, all the structure. So I think a little bit uh, misguided. <coughs> 
Can I say something? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so I think humans deal with a small number, can deal with a small number of objects at a time, really mentally, cognitively, and they kind of have a way to. So this this, this structures make sense there, and they have a way to kind of combine this uh, small number of objects and these key structures via inference rules into bigger and more complicated objects, and that's <coughs> building new knowledge. But understanding is essentially decomposition. Humans mostly decompose existing structures to understand what they do. So that's kind of one understanding. Uh, so in terms of more concretely, kind of in terms of the synthesis, I think one question that I don't see explicitly discussed, but always comes up also in synthesis in here, is whether you want to actually examine the learned artifact, whether you want to explain it. If you want to explain it, um, uh, if you don't want to explain it, then the learning is, can be quite different also in uh, synthesis. So for instance, flash film, you never see the program. You don't want to see the program, the user doesn't want to see the program. So the learning can be very different. I never have to show the program. I don't have to cognitively understand what, is that, what it does. Uh, if you have to show the program, then explaining it discreetly in some way, either via traces or via some other, other behavior of these components, it's, it's, uh, it's important to, to understand. So that depends really immediately what domain you are targeting. If it's end user domain, you don't want to see the program. That's one type of learning. If you want to see the program, more expert algorithm sorting, whatnot, then that's a different kind of learning. So that's kind of adjacent to maybe the discrete question. I think it would be good now to take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, while everyone drinks wine. Um, so I, I read a sentence somewhere on the web. Uh, it says that algorithms basically data structure plus some something that manipulates the data structure. Right? Um, um, I, I, I want to ask what's the data structure of human mind? Like, is a graph type, edge type of graph enough? Like, free ways describe everything with a graph with typed edges. Is that enough? No. <laughs> well, uh, you know, so again, just to, to, to go with the theme I was just saying before, we're very interested in our group right now in intuitive physics, so we're interested in how people think about objects, and we have the idea that you have something like a game physics engine in your head, for example, that's one kind of idea. You know, that's not a, that's not a graph, it has, has, all, has a lot of architecture that goes beyond a graph in order to be able to do something like mentally simulate the physical world or to be able to think about somebody else, what we sometimes call theory of mind, like I'm trying to, you're trying to understand what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Um, if, you know, I, I, I don't see how to get that into just a bunch of triples or you know, standard relational structures. It's, you know, so something that looks more like a Turing universal language, whether it's Lisp or Scheme or Haskell or whatever, um, is got to be part of the picture too. And it's not that graphs aren't, aren't in the picture also, it's just that I don't think, I mean, I think it might, at some point in my research, I thought it would be nice if that was true, because I knew how to build kind of nice probabilistic models over graphs. <laughs> um, but I, uh, no, 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 I think you need more, more sophisticated kinds of data structures and abstractions than graphs. Call, call it higher order logic, or, for example. Or, fuck, or, yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> like, we made up those things and we formalized them in computer science, because that was we were trying we were trying to get something inside our head out in a in a way that we could manipulate um, using our tools. So the, all of those are things that there there are things like that in our head. I kind of have a question targeted at you again. I'm not sure if, I can, if that's okay. Uh, so uh, Alice Graves said the other day that when LSTM came out, uh, it wasn't very I don't know exactly what he said, but it was something like it wasn't very useful or powerful compared to existing models because the amount of data and computational capacity at that time was, was not very high. And it was only like after a few years, like, I don't know, like five, ten years or so, that the LSTM started becoming seen to be really powerful. Uh, so uh, my question to Jürgen is, uh, to what extent do we already have the algorithms that we need and we just need to throw a computational capacity there? And to what extent are there uh, existing challenges that we need to solve uh, to, to move forward? The LSTM, of course, is just a passive pattern observer. So it's it's a pretty cool universal um, pattern recognizer because it can deal with sequences and translate them into other sequences and so on. 
And uh, of course, we have to wait until computers are fast enough to do interesting things such as speech recognition and machine translation and all these things. But it's all about passive observation of the data, and it's not like in reinforcement learning where you really actively generate and shape the incoming um, sensory um, data through your actions. Act, perceive, act, perceive, act, perceive. And where you don't have a teacher which tells you at which point in time should you activate uh, which muscle, um, how strongly to you know, get a sequence of motor movements that lead you to the goal and so on. So the, the, the holy grail of AI definitely is not just this pattern observation thing, but the full loop through the environment reinforcement learning. And there, in general, you also need recurrent networks because you have to deal with partial uh, observability um, as opposed to what you can do with board games. With board games, you can do it with FIFA and networks. And then, um, of course, you um, want to have a controller, a recurrent network, which translates these action sequences and um, observations of the past into, um, into additional motor sequences that lead to goals, and usually it will have a little trend. It's an unsupervised predictive coder of everything that is observed, all failed and useful trials and so on, and it's going to build a model of the world, a predictive model, and it's trying to find regularities, and for, for the second module you can use an LSTM or something else, another RNN or something, something. But then the interaction with uh, of the controller, which doesn't have a teacher, which is like the you know the, the baby that is building its own world model through its experiments, uh, then uh, you you need something else. Uh, you need intrinsic reward, and, and uh, you know as we discussed, uh, uh, reward for aesthetically pleasing pattern generation through the controller, which maybe becomes a composer of music or a physicist that invents new experiments and so on. And, and this is not yet in such an advanced stage as we have in sheer pattern recognition. Now if we now we have um, 75 years after Zeus, so we have a factor of 10 to the 15 now uh, in terms of uh, cheapness of computing power per um, euro or a dollar or something. And we, this means we need another 25 years until we have an LCM with uh, as many connections as the human cortex for you know for a reasonable price, and and from that even if we don't have additional uh, progress in supervised learning with recurrent networks, we, we are, it's kind of clear you will see lots of superhuman performance uh, from from networks like that. I see videos and speech at the same time. You know, combine all these things to make better predictions about what's going to happen and so on. And then, however, we still need a little bit of additional progress in um, in controlling. Uh, recurrent networks that take all this information in these predictive coders and use it to rapidly solve new problems on top of previously solved problems. I'm not sure whether your question was how much longer is it going to take? <coughs> many are solved, many of the puzzle pieces are falling into place on the other hand, we still don't have the computational power that we want, at least not in little apps. And we can teach these agents the notion of beauty or also moral <coughs> values. But you also mentioned earlier that, I'm saying that you even mentioned earlier that these programs can change themselves and improve themselves and change those parameters. So if you wanted to teach these agents the notion of beauty, how like it could um, change um, its own notion of beauty as well as well as the moral values. So it's just like wondering what your thoughts are on that, as well as like from the other people on the panel. Thanks. So the uh, traditional way of um, training systems to uh, generate patterns that people find, uh, find aesthetically pleasing is you just have a website and then you have an like, you know, artificial evolution system and it generates images and external reward is coming by from the outside by people who say this is a nice painting and this is not so nice and so over time you hope that through these evolutionary processes you get better programs that make better pictures. So that is totally external, um, that is externally driven and you are so to speak superimposing your own ideas of beauty onto this machine and it becomes uh, just a reflection of what you like basically. 
And then, of course, the other thing which I was talking about is this own internal sense of beauty, which depends totally on your prior knowledge. Um, for example, um, a baby in, has a lot of interest in mathematics books uh, on the table uh, because it may be able to throw them to the ground and it always makes these interesting noises and then the parents come and pick it up and um, all kinds of predictable things happen but it is not able yet to predict the uh, beauty of the theorems in there. Maybe 20 years later it will be in a stage where through this additional acquired knowledge through uh, 20 years of experience, it suddenly sees additional beauty and the beauty of these theorems there, which describe relations between numbers and whatever, uh, in a way that is very compressible and therefore corresponds to new patterns, where you however need a lot of prior knowledge to understand the pet patterns, because the baby's learning algorithm isn't good enough to see these patterns, um, so it will need additional training. Um, so there's this dichotomy on the one hand, the superimposed ideas of beauty coming from outside, and the self-generated sense of beauty, which depends on what's currently interesting to you and funny to you, and you, you're a baby and you find really different things funny, um, uh, rather than things that your parents find funny. Just to jump in on that, um, again, I, I, find it, I found it very inspiring that things like uh, sense of beauty or humor that you suggested could be captured by some universal compression standard. I, I still feel that, that that isn't quite enough, right? Like you could have an extremely compressible pattern, but that doesn't necessarily make it beautiful. And I think there is there's a mystery that we ought to ponder there. But since I was I was one of the ones who mentioned moral values, I should say this is just something that so we've been working on in our group, um, and a number of people have expressed in certain ways. Like I think there there's a, there's some really compelling and simple um, ways to put, for example, you know. I mean, this is like the oldest tradition, at least in the Western philosophical and religious traditions, of very simple general moral principles like golden rules, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or I think, um, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but something called the platinum rule, maybe due to Popper. Um, it's be better than doing unto others as you would have them do unto you is do unto others as they would want to be done unto, <laughs> right? Um, so those, those, that sounds like logic. It sounds like, again, it's gonna require a, a kind of a, a higher order logic, but, you know, something that we've been working on, for example, is how do you formalize those kinds of moral values with um, programs that could be either wired in some form or learned or induced. Um, and then if you want to say, if, you, if I'm saying um, uh, what it is to be a good person is to do unto you as you would want to be done unto, then I have to have some other programs where I'm going to figure out what, that, you know, what, what you want. <laughs> so I'm going to have to have some understanding of your beliefs and desires. And I think the toolkit that people are working with here is the best candidate we have to try to understand moral cognition in human minds and maybe to also put those into our AI systems. For the people in the middle, I have a, <coughs> to give you a chance. <laughs> I have a concrete question. Can we learn all this stuff end to end with input output summons? Can we learn semantic parsing and to map natural language uh, um, natural language to programs just by collecting a huge enough data set and a massive neural net and train the whole thing end to end with whatever you computer you can get. Good question. I think to some extent you can, but but it might not be the most effective way to do that. And it might not also lead to the most number of insights for tasks other than the thing that you just trained. So I mean I think you know we've seen a lot of kind of impressive results where kind of conventional wisdom has been challenged by what neural nets can and cannot do. So um, I think you know any task where the amount of data can kind of match the complexity of a problem will fall. I don't have any kind of doubt about that. But um, you know I think as a machine learning community, we also should care about kind of sample complexity to some extent, not just kind of end capabilities. And I think it's interesting to ask, you know, how little can you get by and still learn something? And especially when you go to more complicated tasks, I think, you know, the data efficiency is going to be a lot more important. I guess I can say something, so as far as, if you want to learn the function, I mean, it's theoretically possible to learn some of the functions from fun functional behaviors only. It's a non-functional properties, so no matter how much data you give, you will not learn. You may, the function may be there, you may guess it, but there will be cases where you just won't be able to learn it because the spec is not there. Um, 
themselves and you know, asymptotic complexity. So in simple example, there is other ones. Um, so yes, that's the answer. Um, I would have agreed with Percy at first, um, modulo Martin's constraints, um, but I, I, I agree with Percy, I guess. I, I think that, yes, if we have enough data and we have a powerful enough model, we'll learn whatever is encoded in that data set, and so it might not be the actual function that you can recover, but you'll recover something that is consistent with the input-output examples and can generalize around the data that you have in some suitable way. Um, I think that the to add to the sort of data complexity issue is I think there's a lot of opportunities for strong forms of generalization in this domain. And so it could be that a lot of the data that you're training or a lot of the data that you're throwing through the system is redundant if you had a better um, model or you thought more carefully about the structure and the problem. Um, okay, so first I think I want to maybe just clarify a little bit. Here, I guess, when we talk about input and output analysis, and then there are two separate things. So one is talk about um, whether you can do program synthesis just using input and output types. I think for that, I'm a little bit speaking for everyone, but uh, uh, I, I think most people agree that that's not how we write programs. And in general, it's not possible to just to synthesize a program with just input and output examples. No matter how many examples you, uh, assuming you have a finite number of examples, and in general, for complex programs, that's just not how programs are written, and that's not going to be how programs are synthesized. So that's about if we talk about program synthesis using input of text. Um, but I think maybe Nando is also asking a slightly different question, which is just like uh, uh, the progress that people have made with the machine translation, you have you know, English to French, uh, you have a huge amount of data sets, and in that sense, I think also as we know, right? So, so, so first of all, the progress has been truly amazing. Um, and in this case, right, end-to-end -end approach worked well. And of course, one can argue how much this uh, neural machine translate, uh, translator actually understands about language. On one hand, people can say, oh, the uh, internal representation, uh, we see all sorts of properties, uh, and hence it's learning some useful internal representations. But on the other hand, I think it's likely that people can also see that actually um, the, the neural uh, machine translation, uh, translation actually doesn't really understand, it doesn't have this natural language understanding. So similarly, that you can ask the same question. Now, I think to rephrase Nando's question earlier, is that assuming now, you can, one way you can view it as a translation uh, question is you have natural language description of the task you want, and then you translate it into a code. And then the question is if you have lots. So, so one sad part is that we have very little examples, very little data on this. But assuming, uh, as the question that Lando asked, if you have lots and lots of these uh, natural language translation, uh, natural language description uh, translated into code, if you have a lot of this kind of data, then what can we do about it? Then one question you can say, as uh, you know, including my own work and some other people's work, <laughs> I've shown that in, at least in the simple cases, we can build such translator. You can say it's a program synthesis that synthesizing from a natural language description into code. Um, and as we get more examples, I think certainly we can actually um, synthesize more and more uh, uh, complex programs using this approach. And I think actually that will be a great community effort to see how we can collect uh, such a data set. Um, and also then there's a question if you can do now this translation, then now this translator, uh, you can call it a compiler that compiles from a natural language description into code. How well does that actually understand either the natural language or understand the code? I think in this case actually, um, the, I think the answer is probably not uh, as clear as in just translating one language into another, um, because there's um, the natural language description is very very different from the actual code. In the code, you can say actually because it's <coughs> symbolic, it's logical, it naturally incorporates. I think in Chris's term, it would be called the uh, uh, the the. 
so that in this case, in some sense, you can say in order to generate this code from natural language description, in some sense, you need to have some kind of understanding, especially when you can, we are talking about really complex pro uh, programs, but you can see that the, the code in the end is one way, one form of understanding of the task. But of course, as I said, the question, the answer is unclear. There's another question here from the audience. Can, 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 can I quickly? So I, I love the example of, um, of translation that you brought, and it reminds me of, um, of the uh, American author, the famous Nobel Prize winning author, Salinger, who wrote this, The Catch and the Rye, and this was translated in, into German. And um, the translation was good because it was done by another Nobel Prize winner, by Heinrich Böll. Now, he did that much better than Google Translate based on LSE and so on. And of course, because he knew so much about what is love, what is, does it mean to feel the wind in your hair, and to run through the cornfield and all these things. And uh, that's because he had so much more data um, which he could use for simple grounding, if you will. But of course, what's going to happen is that in the not so distant future, these um, uh, recurrent networks are not going only to see the French uh, uh, or, or the American original and the German translation or something like that, but uh, they are going to see all kinds of videos coming in, and somebody is saying, and there's the cat falling from the tree, and somebody is saying, and the cat is falling from the tree, and the network will be able to correlate all these things, and, and in the uh, process, it's going to become a much better translator. So in that sense, I believe that uh, data, more data will lead to better translations in many ways. Sorry for answering not your question, but uh, commenting on hers. Just had a quick comment before this question, because we've hit this problem for many on Peter Call. <clears throat> we worked on it quite a bit, but this is actually a fundamental thing that I already mentioned. It, it, it will keep coming up, it always comes up in different forms. Is if you see the code or not. If you go from NLP or natural language to code, um, you are going from a very high level description to a very, very low level description. So there is a cognitive disbalance there. So if you show a user, 10 line problem that's fairly complicated and even if it's always correct they have a, they have a lot of trouble understanding this There's the gap, the representation gap is too big between natural language and low level code you want something in the middle where it explains the code in some way not in terms of natural language but some other representation that's one of the problems it's not a question of how much data you have, how perfect the translation is it's finding the right representation that people can understand uh, so a lot of the work that I've seen here and before is about finding algorithms, um, executable code. But in real world programming languages, we do a lot more than writing algorithms. We build data types, we, build, we model the world in many various different ways. You know, most languages have a, a type hierarchy where we inherit behavior from the parent. Um, so I wonder uh, how important this is going to be for program synthesis and program learning, and if you have any ideas about how we should approach um, Data structure. Um. Well, I guess I have this. So, so there is there is work in program synthesis in using uh, all the type information and all kinds of semantic information in order to print the search space that's required. Otherwise, to just explode, that that's necessary. Um, so that, that's already used. That's um, logical properties over the program <coughs> invariance, um, typing information, anything you can extract with analysis in order to cut the search space. This is needed. Um, that information, so that's as far as synthesis goes, uh, right? Then also this kind of information you can use to learn over programs. Uh, it's very important information, the features, or however you want to call them, to kind of get more accurate probabilistic models. That's absolutely true. It's needed. And it's actually they talk about programming language. There's actually no programming language. You have JavaScript. This JavaScript can be described in one page. The language actually is the thousands and thousands of libraries that people use and you actually cannot write a spec about what those things do because there's no formal spec, you have to learn it. So actually, a lot of the synthesis, forget about synthesize the program in the language, learn the language. There is actually no language that is formalized. There is ways of using idioms in the language and so on and so forth, but actual programming language in the way you program with all these millions of libraries, <coughs> this formal spec doesn't exist. So anything you can get from the type system, from how APIs are used, that, that's needed in order to learn um, suitable, let's say, probabilistic models over the language. 
I'll maybe address that in two ways. One is maybe more mundane, which is, I think, uh, if you're talking about synthesizing data structures as a boy and work on that, uh, I think because once you can get something executable, you can apply similar techniques. But I think there's a more interesting aspect of the question, which is um, when you're learning from kind of execution, kind of the only signal that you have about the validity of a program is basically kind of correctness, whether it's computing the right thing. Um, but I think that view portrays programs as kind of static objects where you synthesize and then you're done, right? But I mean, code is a very kind of a dynamic thing. It changes over time. And uh, specs and change over time, APIs change over time. And many of the desiderata in real code is due to um, making sure that you can actually change things over time. So I think that's another important consideration when doing program synthesis, which I think hasn't really been addressed that much, and I think it's harder to uh, formalize. Just to, again, agree on, agree with and expand on what you guys are saying, um, I think if we're really going to go towards something like real AI, or if we want to understand the kinds of human learning things that I was talking about, we're going to have to go beyond what we call what we currently call program induction or program synthesis, to really all the activities that we do with programs. Um, there's a metaphor that we've been exploring in our group, which is inspired by, some, some people might have heard of the idea of what's called the child as scientist, like the idea that a lot of children's activities um, in learning about the world are kind of like science. We form theories, we test hypotheses, we do experiments, our active learning, you know, we have curiosity driven, just like scientists, except we're mission driven. And it's been a very productive metaphor for a couple of decades in developmental psychology, looking for all the ways that children's learning and thinking is kind of like science. Um, uh, currently, we're, look, we're looking at a complementary metaphor, which we affectionately refer to as the child as hacker. And by that, we don't mean like the people who hack in and steal your credit card numbers or your passwords, but you know the MIT sense or whatever, the, the sense of like all the things we do with our code to make it more awesome. And that can include making up new data structures or new types or writing whole new languages or new libraries and existing languages. I think all the ways that we, that we in, in our, in, as programmers, modify code to make it more awesome, those are things that we're going to have to think about making algorithmic if we want algorithms which can explain how human cognition develops or how AI systems need to come to learn to be intelligent like humans. So following up on that and connecting it with the beginning when you were talking about uh, the more abstract representations versus the more neural network representations. Inductive bias is key for all of this, right? And if you were to take a trained neural network, trained with lots of data, you may find the abstract structures that, that you like to talk about. Uh, and so then the question of how do you impose a model bias in a system like a brain or a neural network is a very interesting one. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. How does the low level representation allow you to impose some fairly high-level biases. Are you speaking specifically of brains or like to some kind of neural network system? General. I'm not sure how, well, I'll let you guys comment on that. I, I, I think that's a very hard question. That's why I'm asking it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, <clears throat> so let's take like NTMs or APIs or one of these systems there uh, that have an explicit, explicit representation of memory, right? Okay. So there you can actually write uh, logical sketches and compile them or partial programs and compile them straight to the straight to the read write heads on the tape and you can change your loss function to take this into account. So that we've done, we get uh, much faster convergence. Um, you have to be careful what you mean by partial program and sketch and all these kind of things that uh, whether you're not, you don't know the solution, you just encode it. Um, but it can be done. No. It's actually fairly direct. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Okay. All right, so the question is, uh, in fields like reinforcement learning, we're starting to get excited with end-to-end -end learning, uh, where we're combining different, very different, uh, let's say, uh, areas of the brain, like uh, visual cortex and decision making. So something like learning from pixels to all the way to executing a task, like a locomotion task or a manipulation task. Um, but we know that in the brain, we actually have kind of a, a lot of modularity, right? So it's not like uh, all the neurons are talking to all other neurons, all the brain regions talking to all the other brain regions. So my question is, how do we, in a principled way, 
uh, understand what is the right uh, way to do modular uh, problems, I guess you guys here are looking at problems, or is the correct way to just think of everything as one big program, and we're just limited by computation, uh, this is why we're doing modularity. So principled way of, uh, ways of doing modularity, do they? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think modularity is actually quite important um, for, especially for kind of the strong generalization that you know, kind of talked about. So for an example from the talk I gave earlier on question answering, so there's kind of two aspects of the two modules, if you will. One is understanding the question, and one is kind of knowing the answer. And it's clear that there is a very real sense in which these are different, because you can do one without doing the other, and vice versa, by asking a question in you know, a foreign language, you might know the answer, but not be able to understand the question. Um, so I think that helps with, uh, that kind of modularity helps with data efficiency, um, but it also helps with kind of you know, extrapolation, because if you don't impose this, then you kind of have to see all pairs of, kind of, or a random kind of sample of questions and, you know, in, in languages. But if you have this uh, strong kind of coupling, then you can actually, you know, see maybe some, uh, you know, distribution that's uh, generalized to something that you've never seen before in the Yeah, to add that, I think, uh Maybe to make physics statements uh, even stronger is that I think we pretty much all agree that the modularity is a must. I don't think we can actually synthesize large programs without being able to without modularity. I think that's just not possible. Um, and but the challenge is that we haven't figured out yet how to get this modularity automatically, and that of course is. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we haven't gotten that yet. And I would say, I think also for, you know, for many people here, like just from personal experience, we also know, right, like when people, even when humans try to design and build a large system, we all know that a good practice is to make the system modular. But how to make it modular is actually, uh, you can say it's an art, or it's a really challenging task, and also depends on what the system's overall goal is, and, um, and that also keeps changing, and, and so on. So the modularity that I think our program synthesis system will uh, have also, in some sense, I think will have similar characteristics. It's not just one way to do modularity. You need to have a way, given the goal, given the task, you need to automatically figure out what kind of modularity to use, and maybe there are many different, there are different ways to, uh, to do this modularity. I just don't wait. I think there is very little of that to me. No, I, I do agree in many ways. However, um, we also do get automatic modularity in large networks that just try to do predictive coding of all the incoming data. And then, of course, um, they develop little uh, sub-networks for the stuff that frequently occurs. You know, if you have lots of faces in your environment, then you come up with something like an internal prototype phase, such that you have to only um, encode the deviations from the prototype whenever a new phase comes along, whenever you have um, processes where gravity plays a role while objects are falling down. You have a little network which is re-invoked again and again, which helps predict that better and so on. And it's um, partially depending on other recurrent networks uh, that have been learned before, which also can't use their share. So we do get a lot of um, modularity. It's, it's only sometimes a, a little bit of an effort to look afterwards in there and say, oh, okay, now this is the sub-program that does that, and this is the sub-program that does that, and so on. But we do get to data compression, automatic and modularity of many kinds already. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, definitely. So even, for example, feature extraction automatically the new features, you can say that's, uh, that's one form of modularity. Uh, but for program synthesis, I think we need a more sophisticated, more advanced form of modularity. So for example, the NPI work that uh, Nando did, um, that's, I mean, it's a very, it, it's a great piece of work. And, uh, uh, in there, you can see it has modularity as well. But right now, the sub-programs essentially is you have to tell it the sub-programs. But for true modularity, we would like the system to automatically learn the sub-programs. And this, I think, is what we would like to. So one way to evaluate how good a system for 
developing modularity is just how effective is it in helping you build larger programs. Um, so I think ultimately what we want is we want to, this it ties in with what you're going to say, that you know, modularity is good insofar as it helps us to build larger programs. I think one thing that is also important in the um, in this story about modularity is when we're doing program synthesis, I think bottom-up cues are really helpful, where if you have some description of a task, then if you have this modular setup, you know, you have a library that you know does algorithmic stuff, and you know that you're going to need something from there, then giving a name to this unit and having a module that you can then go into and find the components that you need to use, uh, I think that imposes some additional constraints on what you want um, from some system of modularity. So in terms of like uh, modularity, I mean this compositionality, modularity are actually not an undefined term, so what exactly this means there in the But in terms of what Don said, just to follow up, there is nice work out of Stanford, I think, uh, last year, the TODI, which is uh, learning uh, um, instructions out of other instructions. So if you give it some base components, as it's learning, it's going to learn composite instructions, and then use those. Two. So this is actually an idea you can directly apply to MPI. Uh, I'm going to ask you to send me all those citations. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll echo the other speakers in agreeing with the essentialness and centrality of modularity, compositionality. They may be vague notions, but they're absolutely essential. And maybe just again, because it's getting late, and to give, give us something controversial and stimulating, maybe for some of us to think about over dinner. Um, as a challenge to people who might think that the, the sort of modularity is just something that's going to emerge out of some low level architectural biases in a neural network, whether it's a real one in the brain or in an artificial neural network. You know, I think here's a challenge for, you know, like I'm inspired, Jurgen, by RNNs that can modify other RNNs. But, you know, there's still as one RNN modifying another RNN or modifying the parameters of a learning algorithm. And until we have, you know, that's, that's a basic kind of modularity right there. Until we have an RNN that can come up with the idea of an RNN, <laughs> like you did, or, you know, to come up with the idea of a neural Turing machine, like Alex Graves and colleagues did, you know, that, that's, that's, I don't just see that thing kind of emerging about low level architectural biases. I think we've got to have systems which, in their architecture, hardware, and software, have the kind of symbolic computational abilities that, um, that you know that we have that we have figured out how to engineer into our into our uh, computers and our programming languages. And that's you know when you ask again, what are the roadblocks? I mean, the biggest roadblock is I, I, if I want to be kind of grandiose, I like to call it our modern mind-body problem, right? When we look at the architecture of the brain, we don't see the things that look like that. But when we look at the architecture of the mind, we do see, I, I don't see any other credible alternative to that kind of symbolic architecture. So understanding how to link up that high level to what's obviously both very useful on the engineering side in neural networks and very real on the biological side of actual neural networks in the brain, trying to make that bridge is, is a huge challenge that I hope everybody here will think about and we could all spend our lives and careers on it. It's not the kind of thing that's going to fall in, in a couple of years. That's a great place to end this. Uh, let's thank our panel. Um, I'd also like to thank Tejas and Marco let, let, can we, can, as one of the participants, can we, we thank all of the organizers, especially Nando for leading a great. All the organizers, all except me. Thank you all in the audience. It was great having you here. If you have more questions, they're here. <laughs>